Welcome everyone and um, welcome to today's forum. Uh, this is the first Corona-19 forum hosted by the Seoul National University National Strategic Committee. The title of today's forum is the COVID-19 pandemic at Korea's response and challenges. I am pa Park Do-jun, professor and a member of SNU National Strategy Committee. I am very happy to have this opportunity with all of you. Very soon, we will begin our forum together with the presentations and discussions. To begin with, the host of today's forum, the main host, of this forum is the Hong Jun Young, the president of SNU National Strategic Committee. He will deliver the opening speech. Hello, everyone. I am 
President Hong Jin-young of SNU National Strategic Committee. As you are well aware, Corona-19 pandemic has driving the whole world into the crisis. Four months has passed since it happened. Maybe it will be considered as the biggest crisis in this century. Still, we don't see any signs of ending yet, and the situation and crisis have become worsened in every aspect of life. And the confirmed cases have been increased by 32 this morning, so many people worry about that. Seoul National University National Strategic Committee is hosting this forum under the title of Corona Pandemic Responses and Challenges of Korea. This is the 30th SNU National Policy Forum as well. When it comes to the response to the Corona Pandemic of Korea, it is getting a lot of attention from at home and abroad. So the Korean central government and the local governments have created opportunities to share our strategies and many other institute and research centers also have engaged in many different dialogues so far. So as a new National Strategic Committee, believe this forum will be a great opportunity to evaluate if the responses of the government, WHO, and civil society are relevant. So you can call it a type of an interim evaluation. And also, it will be the first forum of the National Strategy Forum to deal with the Corona-19. Professor and President Oh Sejong of SNU will give you the opening, uh, the welcoming speech, and then in the session one, we will talk about the responses of the government and WHO to the Corona-19, and in the session two, we will talk about the civil society's responses of Corona-19. In the session one, we will have three speakers, of Professor Ji Youngmi and. Lee Jong-gu, Jung gi Seok, and the discussant, Professor Park Hong-jun and Jung seung yong Thank you for your participation. And in the session two, uh, researcher Kim Myung-hee, and Professor Park gi Su and Professor Yoo Myung-soon, and Professor Park Sang-won and Kim Ui young will be there in the session two. Thank you for your participation. And this forum is an online forum. It is now being broadcasted live online and all the videos will be produced and uploaded on many different channels. And our committee is planning to have follow-up forums to talk about the many changes in the political, economic, and societal perspectives in the era of a post-corona uh, era in the second half of this year. So all this data will be released and open to the public on the SNU website. And we will, at the same time, build up the databases for the research. Once again, I'd like to give my deepest appreciation to all the participants on on and offline to be here with us on behalf of the Seoul National University National Strategy Committee. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite President Oh Se Jung for a welcome speech. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Oh Se Jung, President of Korea, Seoul National University of uh, Korea. First of all, thank you for joining us from online and also on the site, despite your busy schedule. My special thanks and warm welcome go to all of you. This um, COVID-19 pandemic has been affecting everywhere around the world, and citizens in the world have been saying that there will be a different future and there will be a new normal. And as a university at this moment, we have to fully utilize the expertise of professionals and to make sure that we are doing and responding well and what we're going to do for a better future. When it comes to this issue, it doesn't just revolve around one discipline. It involves medical, science, 
society, and also education. That is why we need to all gather together and take an inter and multidisciplinary approach. I believe that many experts and professionals would have a joint venue to carry out in-depth research with other industry leaders. And when it comes to predicting our future, we believe that we will be able to come up with better and more fruitful outcome through today's event. However, when it comes to sharing our research results, that should not be the end of everything. Just like how we have been responding so far, even though uh, the reason why Korea is mentioned as one of the leading nation when it comes to quarantine measures, voluntary citizens uh, played a key role in the whole process. So I would say the second role that professionals have to take is to share the results of academic research towards gen the general public so that they are persuaded and convinced and better understand about what is going on. With this better understanding, they will be more willing to follow the measures and guidelines provided from the government and the academi academia. So by holding this event, this will uh, be a great opportunity for us to better understand each industry and each um, academic field. I don't see many people here due to the pandemic issue, but I believe that there are many people joining us uh, via online. Just like Professor Hong mentioned earlier, this is not going to be the end of our forum. After this event, we will continuously hold many And today marks the very first beginning of our journey. I hope that you obtain great and fruitful knowledge from the forum. And I hope that this will clear your path of research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President. Now I will, we would like to begin the first session of today. The first session is titled under the government and WHO response against COVID-19 crisis. Let me introduce our first speaker for the first session. We have Dr. Chi Young Mi. She is specialized in infectious diseases and uh, also headed the National Healthcare Research Institute, and she also participated as a member of WHO COVID-19 Emergency Committee. Good afternoon. Good to see you all. First of all, thank you for giving me this great opportunity. Today, I'd like to talk about in the face of the COVID-19 outbreak, WHO has taken actions, but many try to evaluate if their responses is relevant and enough or the proper. So I'd like to give you the explanations from the emergency committee's perspective that I'm taking in. This is the agenda that I'd like to talk about. In uh, the ro I'd like to talk about the roles of WHO in the related to the emerging infectious disease and the some the IHL regulations and what kind of research and development activities WHO is doing. And also, I'd like to give you a brief explanations about WHO country joint mission. And, and then I'd like to talk about if WHO reform is required or a new global health initiative is better. 
So in facing of the emerging infectious disease, the WHO has a clear role. The first is to collect data and risk assessment and information sharing. And they are preparing and distributing all different technical guidances. Related to the COVID-19, they have issued 234 technical guidances so far. And each country is having the IHR focal point, so the WHO is having the communications with them. They can also team up the emergency committee and decide whether to declare the PHEIC or emergency. And also there is a R&D blueprint under the WHO and GLOPIDR, which is largely working in the European continent. So WHO is coordinating these two organizations at the same time. Also, if required, they are providing the technical support via the GOARN. This is the, special, the network for the specialists. And there are three different levels, headquarters, regional offices, and country offices. Country offices, there are about 150 country offices. And actually, that the, the people who is working in the offices are going to the front lines to take connections to such as providing supplies, things like that. And for the vulnerable countries, the, the WHO will carry out joint missions. And for this case of COVID-19, uh, about 80 missions have been carried out in China, Italy, and I Iran. Of course, all these kind of activities requires money, and they are doing the fundraising. The target is about the six hundred seventy-five million dollars, but less than fifty, less than fifty percent of them achieved. And Korea has donated three point three million dollars as well. There are six different regions under the WHO, as you can see in the screen. The European region has shown the biggest number of confirmed cases, but now the Americas has bigger number. Actually, the, the confirmed cases are exponentially growing from the South of America, and Africa is showing the least number of confirmed cases, but people are worrying because Africa has a very poor infra healthcare infrastructure, as well as poor and weak food security. An emergency committee was summoned on the 30th of January, and they, during that EC, they declared the PHEIC. But before then that, a lot of technical guidances have been produced and distributed under the leadership of the WHO. So this is the website of the WHO. You can find all many different information there. And there is a rolling update you can update and share the update in real time. And this is the technical guidance. As I mentioned earlier, we, they have produced about 234 technical guidelines in every different field. And one of the good and representative example is response preparedness. It was issued early February. They mentioned the three things. First is international coordination and each country's response capability. So they need to scale up the, their capability and the speed of the R&D. These three have been mentioned in that book. And regarding R&D, February, there was R&D Global Forum on the 14th February and they established the R&D roadmap for the COVID-19. And again in April, the strategy has been updated to be released. So in the face of the EID, WHO is carrying out the role according to the IHR. The IHR is kind of binded all the WHO member countries. The very beginning of the IHO was the cholera epidemic. So when the cholera epidemic uh, when, when there was the cholera outbreak, outbreak, they summoned international sanitary regulations in 1851, and then they revised it 
1969, and they revived it again in 2005, and this has become effective from 2007. So the main target of IHR is to prevent the spread of the disease across borders and also help each country uh, detect the confirmed cases as soon as possible and to treat them. So through the IHR, WHO can declare the PHEIC. And whenever the outbreak happened, each country is mobilized to, to report the situation within 24 hours. And then WHO will team up the emergency committee. Uh, they uh, decide to whether to open up the emergency committee depending if it has a possibility to spread across the world and what, how severe, serious impact it can have. Including COVID-19, there have been six PHEIC, and the one in red are still under PHEIC. When PHEIC is declared, the GORN network will be activated so that the experts will go out on the front line to help people out. And for the ASEAN region, there is a specific organization named APSED. So this agency help each country in Asia to carry out the IHR. So this time again, WHO declared the PHEIC. Let me just give you the process and decision making process. So they had telephone connection. The director general himself opened and closed the emergency committee. Because they consider DOI, the conflict of interest is very important. So whenever they have the meeting, they check the DOI. And then uh, the, 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 the countries who is at risk will make a presentation. So this time, China make a pretty long presentation. And then some other affected countries will make a statement after that. And then it will be followed by the Q&A. And after all the speakers are leaving the room, and they will, the other members will have to close the session to make a decision. Throughout the closed session, they will decide if the PHEIC should be declared and what kind of a temporary recommendation should be made. Once, uh, the, even though the EC decided to declare PHEIC, they have to have another meeting within three months to decide to keep PHEIC condition or suspend it. So the first meeting happened 22nd of January. And from the, and as soon as the Wuhan, the, the Chinese government decided to lock down the Wuhan, they had another meeting. Uh, China had made very long presentations, which including meaningful and important to messages. Uh, they said there are human to human transmissions and the preliminary arrow is estimated about 1.4 to 5. And the mortality rate is about 4%. And there has been already fourth generation cases. And they found implications in one healthcare facility. And the severity rate was about 25%. Back then, they, China is the origin of the disease, and the other countries doesn't have a local and community transmission. So they didn't make this kind of uh, recommendations, and they, they didn't declare the PHEIC back then, and instead of that, they just decided to have another meeting in, uh, in, in very soon. But they asked the Chinese government to, to strengthen the surveillance because they will have the lunar, lunar, lunar holidays. And the, during the second meeting, they declared the PHEIC. And they decide to have the joint mission as soon as possible. So actually, from February 16th to 24th, there were the, there were the joint mission. And the Professor Lee jong of Korea has joined the team. And to China, they made a lot of recommendations. And one of that is conduct access screening. And to all co other countries, WHO recommended 
not uh, doesn't uh, didn't recommend to not do, doesn't recommend any travel or trade restrictions. And for the specific, in order to avoid some stigma or discrimination, uh, the WHO strongly recommend not to do it. And there was another meeting. And uh, during the third meeting, they all the participants agreed to keep the PHEIC condition for the time being. And they decided and recommended to support vulnerable countries. And they also produced uh, some guidelines and guidances. And the solidarity clinical trials are out there. Whenever they are doing the clinical trials, not only the high income countries, but also low and mid income countries should be included. And another recommendation is about uh, while we are trying to find out the sources of the virus, so we have to keep all parties, re relevant parties included. And related to the R&D, the WHO pay great attention to that. Much, much before then the declarations of PHEIC, they have, they have teamed up nine different uh, working groups for R&D that covers wide and diverse topics. So after the declaration, they had the global forum in the middle of the February, and after that, the global roadmap have, have established, and that was released, and as I understand, Korea has also dedicated to that. And regarding the therapeutics and the vaccines, international solidarity clinical trials is underway, and they are comparing four different treatment options. The April, as of April 27th, a total of about 1,600 patients are enrolled from 11 countries, and more than 120 vaccines are in development, and 10 are under clinical trial. And the initiative named the COVID-19 Tool Accelerator was created, so many other global partners, including global funds, are taking part in this activities and they encourage more partners to take part in this uh, initiative. When it, and there are a lot of research and development in therapeutics and all the data are updated in re, almost in real time. This is the number of the research and development status. Uh, the more than three, 2,300 studies have been registered and Korea, eight, USA, 153 are on the way. Actually, Korea, the number of studies in Korea is not that big, but we are having difficult times as the number of uh, confirmed cases has increased exponentially in the past. We have been doing pretty good job, but in the process of dealing with all the confirmed cases, we have accumulated a lot of epidemiological and pol strategical data that should be well established and shared for better research and development. And also Korea need to expand investment in R&D and to strengthen the cooperation with the global partners. These are the challenges suggested by the WHO. First of all, we have to build up and scale up the, uh, the capabilities and capacities for each field. Since it is a new emerging disease, there we have not we don't have a good understanding and knowledge about it, so we need to study further. And at the same time, we need to reduce the transformation while making a balance between economic and societal needs. So WHO China conducted a joint mission. Since the Wuhan, city of Wuhan was locked down from January, th January 13th, as you can see, around at that time, the epic curve has been decreased. They have practiced the social distancing very thoroughly, 
and the similar missions were conducted 2015 when Korea suffered from MERS seriously. Back then, the PHEIC was not declared, but the quarantine system of Korea was turned out to be very weak. Since then, we have put a lot of efforts to improve that. And to prepare for the joint mission, which was, which was usually last a week, we spent six months to prepare for the joint mission. Actually, I was the head of that joint mission. Ten different ministries and agencies took part in that joint mission. It was pretty big, and thanks to everyone's efforts, we got pretty good results. We got 4.52 out of 5, so it was the highest among all the joint mission missions. So Korea has turned out to improve our response capacity to EID after MERS. And to carry out, to afford each country to carry out IHR, there are four different criteria fields. The first is that they have to prepare annual report to submit to the WHO. It is obligation. And there are three more works, like a follow up evaluation and joint mission. And these three are voluntary basis. Personally, I believe by making this kind of actions obligation, we can enhance the role of IHR. Uh, the number 100 means that the joint missions, actually, uh, the joint mission have been carried out in 100 different countries from two, 2016 to 2018. So many people raise the questions if WHO's role is proper. So some, even some other people argue that we need to create a new global health initiative. But I believe it is nonsense to create a new global health initiative. Currently, 196 countries are member of WHO. They have uh, eight, one HQ and six regional offices and 150 country offices, which hire about seven to 8,000 steps. And all of them are trying hard to win against COVID-19. As you can see on the right side, it's about the reform of WHO. There has been a lot of dialogues about, about, the, about WHO reform. The one, is about the IHR. So many say that they, we have WHO has to strengthen IHR. There was an Ebola outbreak, outbreak in 2014. Back then, WHO was criticized and not making relevant relevant responses to that. So USA initiated another effort, which um, have. 67 member states to work together. But since the USA has changed its administration, uh, that initiative is losing momentum. So even though we are creating a new initiative or a new organization, it's really difficult to, to create the better agencies than the existing one. Since we are talking about the reforms, but actually the Director General of WHO, Tedros, try to change the organization and transform. Oh, this is the organizational chart. What you have to focus on is that they created a chief scientist. It includes digital health. And it also create it also have emergency preparedness, let alone em emergency responses. Actually, the current two director general highlights the importance of universal health coverages. So there is a separate uh, team to lead universal health, health coverages. The goal of the transformation is to break down the silos across WHO programs and to provide actual and beneficial helps to each member countries. And I personally believe it's working pretty well. Today, yes, for the couple of 
for the last two days, for the first time, we had online WHA where the President Boon took part in. So to make a conclusion, then instead of making a new initiative, I believe we can uh, improve the roles of WHO to be responsible better in the face of the EID. And out of the four components that I mentioned, the voluntary-based area should turn into the obligation, and they have to hit on the each different country's needs, then that's the best way to improve the WHO. Because th so far, they have tried to accept the opinions from the low-income countries, but we have to improve the channels to get opinions from the high-income company, co companies at the same time. So by doing so, we can improve the roles of WHO. So the country office actually is working at the front line, so we need to empower the country offices a little further to carry out better roles of WHO. Whenever Korea is taking part in the meetings of organized by WHO, the w Korea should be vocal a little further. That, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Let me briefly share about um, today's events instead of gathering questions right after each presentation we're going to have a discussion at the end of each session and then um, following the discussion we're going to gather questions from the floor and also from online and for about 15 minutes our speakers and discussants are going to answer the questions so as you are listening to presentations, if you happen to have some questions, please post your questions online. We will collect your questions and then answer the questions later. Let me introduce our second speaker for session one. We have Seoul National Medical Professor Chung Gu Lee. And um, he used to lead the former KCDC and he was in charge of national response to infectious diseases in the past. He's going to deliver a presentation on COVID-19 responses and, and international cooperation. Please give him a big hand. I think my topic for today um, should be about international cooperation, which is located between Korea's domestic response and also international, namely WHO's response. So it's a time for us to think about how we have been um, managing and responding between the two different realms. People have been talking about the new term called untacked. We are building a new order. When we do not have vaccination and any treatment and cure for the virus, we are ushering in a new lifestyle, namely lockdowns and social distancing. Because this virus is spreading rather quickly, even though these are not recommended and beneficial for our societal functions, we do not have any other choices. Robert Turton said recently that COVID-19 might not be the worst case scenario. There could, the worst case scenario is still waiting for us, meaning there could be another disastrous effect that we might face. And the main cause and culprit of the current crisis was originated in the interconnectivity between animals and humans. And the reason, the reason why the virus is spreading so quickly is because of this interconnectivity. 
when it comes to sustainable development of humankind, we have to emphasize on one health. However, paradoxically, we need to disconnect the relationship between different species in order to break away from the virus. So today, I'm going to talk about current trends and major response measures and how these uh, new infectious diseases have been appearing in our society and how we're going to solve the crisis while maintaining the interconnectivity. For the last 120 days, about 4.7 million people were infected and three, about 300,000 casualties have occurred. So from many different responses, we need to learn what has been good and we need to stay away from what has been bad. I think calling K quarantine or K response is too early to say because it is not the end. We do not know who is going to be the final winner of this crisis. If you make everything into average when it comes to the death rate of each country, we do not uh, fare well compared to other countries. We, have, we might be viewed as we are doing better because of a special characteristics of the Xinjiangji blow up, but to be honest, if you eliminate the Xinjiangji church factor, we are just at an average. So now let's go back to our responses. Um, so far, when there is no cases appearing, we carried out all possible measures to deter the spread of the virus. For example, you have to book that you're going to go somewhere before you visit somewhere, and you we emphasized on social distancing, wearing masks, and using hand sanitizers and washing hands continuously. And after this, the number of cases ex expanded significantly the government created community treatment centers to prevent hospitals being paralyzed. But if you think about it, about 2,000 people were, intensive, were in intensive cure u care units from 10,000 total cases. The reason why we went through a crisis even though we had only 2,000 intensive care unit patients was because we do not have any reserve system. We do not have enough space for intensive patients um, to be hosted. That is why we need to think about this factor as we are preparing for the second wave. When you are talking about um, quarantine and social distancing, these still remain vital and important as we are preparing for the next wave. And now we have to think about what we're going to do once this wave hits our country. If you think about the characteristics of the virus, from the very early stage, we have been carrying out quarantine and isolation. Every um, Every aspect of society has to work together. That is why the government support is very necessary. Without those uh, social or governmental support and uh, voluntary participation from the public, we cannot go anywhere. All countries have been emphasizing the importance of participation for social distancing and this high rate of participation from Korean citizens have been contributing to our excellent results so far. And there's a chance that cases will appear from overseas. And we have to create many different scenarios that might occur in the future. And currently, the CDC of Korea has been drawing and 
designing those crises and response measures accordingly. In the post-COVID-19 crisis, the vital policy that we have to maintain is social distancing. And how we're going to shape our new normal is a, an issue as well. When the new second wave comes back, how we're going to shape our normal daily lives is what experts are thinking about. And now I want to talk about what we have been doing to fight against newly infectious diseases. And I believe that the first attempt of humankind against infectious diseases was in 1992, or namely um, initiated by the Institute of Medicine of the US. And after the past Russian regime uh, collapsed during the 1990s, many healthcare experts had this in mind. And after some time, SARS spread across the world. And at that moment, the director of the WHO, Dr. Lee, changed some of the regulations and policies when it comes to how each country should respond against infectious diseases. And the US also created the Global Health Security Initiative in 2001, and they focused on bilateral diplomacy and relationships in the initiative. Because the US does not have much trust on WHO, they created their own um, regulations and rules on response measures with other countries under the form of bilateral relations. And Dr. Fauci um, wrote a report and said in the report that early diagnosis programs and vaccination development programs might be able to contain uh, new infectious diseases. So he was rather optimistic back then. But if you think about what is happening today, those optimistic predictions and forecasts were rather wrong. So to fight against infectious diseases, what do we do? We mainly contain or we uh, distance one another. If you think about the law of quarantine in the past, we are basically following what we have been doing historically. We have changed our Prevention Act and Quarantine Act, and we added other infectious diseases into our act to create a management system. So instead of managing from control of borders, we are containing from source and at source. And we also uh, created a more intensive and extensive form of contingency task force so it can include natural disaster as well as public health events. Then, even though we have created, I had created IH, uh, a IHR before, and even though we have the U WHO guidelines, why did individual countries uh, look down on or ignore those guidelines? Because countries tend to focus on protecting their own citizens instead of following the international guidelines. Politics have played a role in the response measures. That is how the coordinated response measures did not take place. They have been operating individual and their um, nation nation's own way of responding to the virus. 
now we have to think about how we're going to relieve lockdowns and shutdowns. Of course, we have to think about whether uh, the virus is contained from overseas, and we have to see how the number of cases is changing in the society. To do so, we need to monitor and review what has been happening. Some examples would be we can encourage work from home, or we can encourage um, carrying out video or teleconferences. If our society can accept this new trend or way of living, then we, will, we might be able to go back to non-distancing past. However, once we do that, then the number of cases will grow, in my personal opinion. And of course, it's individual nations' uh, decision making. And the WHO also said it is, it is up to individual countries. And if you think about um, the shutdown of national borders, it is actually against an ar uh, the Article 43 of the WHO. But no country um, cares about this in order to protect their, protect their own citizens. The reason why the WHO thinks that this is a violation is because the shutdown of borders itself will not prevent the spread of the virus. And there is an alternative measure to fight against the virus other than shutting down national borders. Except for only a few um, infectious diseases specialists, almost everyone agrees that it is rather unuseful to shut down national borders. So if you think about how the WHO operates, processes, actors, roles, organizations, and IH IHR have not been working properly. Properly, The U.S. have been constantly fighting against China and vice versa instead of efficiently operating the tools that they have made under the, the WHO. So the WHO assembly is being carried out by individual nations, Ministry of uh, Foreign Relations, and during emergency and during contingency times, this, emergen this uh, way of working does not happen. In 2014, form, um, the predecessor of Margaret Chan has been blamed for non-proper action against Ebola. WHO is a, a consortium of different organizations and bodies instead of a central organization where the head can um, make orders for specific actions. So if you think about the UN, there is peace corps who will be sent to different parts of the world. But if you think about how the WHO operates, they only make suggestions and advice to different situations. And the second director, Michael Iron, um, he's studied uh, diseases and he's from Ireland. And he reformed the organizational structure, streamlined the organization, and made into two different main functions. Because uh, he came in due to the Ebola crisis in Africa, he um, made this change, but also received a great deal of criticization. Even though uh, we may think that there will be many different officials and officers underneath him, actually, there's only him, whether it's Ebola or SARS, there are not many uh, functioning or working level people underneath different departments. They basically outsource different personnel to operate those organizations. 
That is why they are not responding quickly to what is happening around the world. And that is why all the countries are relying on bilateral relations rather than a global approach. By IHM is in charge of Ebola and SARS. And in the past, the organization was divided into five different departments, but this got streamlined into two, as I mentioned earlier. So now, thinking about the post-COVID-19 era, in my personal opinion, we have been relying on the WHO for the last 100 years. I don't think the WHO's existence or presence will disappear all of a sudden just because of the current crisis. As they were uh, creating H IHR, investigation was first introduced to the system, and it is more about uh, preventing biological attacks or crises. But I still believe that the WHO does not have enough power to bring any tangible actions or responses in each country. Mm, in January, on January 19th, they uh, amended the law about um, preventing infectious diseases, but before that, there was no specific or stipulated content or regulations or rule about and how to respond to infectious diseases. So this shows that their administrative system is not well organized and it is also not transparent. So I still believe that the value, quote unquote, health for all is valued. And we try to learn from this value that the WHO holds. Uh, what the Korean government has been doing has been the standard in the globe. And I also honestly think that there's not much to learn from other countries. That is why the Korean government needs to focus on how we're going to operate our governance and healthcare service and healthcare um, practices are one of the main human rights that every citizen in the world holds. So instead of saying or focusing on K responses or K quarantine, that's just a nonsense. We need to focus on international lo level. It is about serving for humankind, and it is about our existence for this great and noble value. That is what Korea needs to do in this world. Exchanges are highly encouraged as well. You need to share information and findings with other countries. And both bilateral and multilateral approaches can be valid. There was a healthcare cooperation between Korea, Japan, and China in 2007 against AI. And tra technological transfer, education, and training will be more effective when they are carried out under bilateral relationships. And in by participating in such practices, it'll be very efficient for Korea to promote its excellence around the world. When Korea citizens were blocked from going into different countries, there was a huge criticization about the government. And after Korea fared better, 
Korean government and Korean practices have been highly welcomed by other countries, whether it's bilateral or multilateral. I believe it's timely for us to strengthen exchanges between different countries. This virus, the COVID-19, is all interconnected between different spots and spaces. I would like to suggest two things for the future. Suppression strategies have been efficient so far, but this has a great danger as well because socioeconomic factors are very important. People are becoming jobless. So it is a starvation versus death from illnesses. And you can see that there is also inequality playing a role in the pandemic. Colored people, people with color, are dying more than the other party. We have to minimize the number of overseas cases. We have to share our no knowledge and their findings as well between countries. We have to make sure that there are no more national borders lockdowns in the future. We have to strengthen healthcare diplomacy. We have to develop vaccination. We have to prevent um, infected, case pa infected patients to come to Korea. These are some of the joint challenges that all countries have to overcome. New in infectious diseases are constantly appearing, and there's no way to prevent it. The only way to fight against this fact or trend is to fight together. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so far, we have listened to the presentations about how WHO has been responded to and how Korea has made actions and measures in the international crisis. And let me introduce you the third speaker, Professor Jung Gi Seo at the Hallin University will be delivered the third presentation. He also was the head of the KCBC right before the current head. And actually, he is the designer of the current KCBC system, and the current KCBC is implementing what he, what he created while he was leading the agency. So we are narrowing down the topic to talk about how the Korean government has responded to the COVID-19, and he will evaluate the measures and the future direction. Please welcome him with a big hand. Yeah, Great to see you all. My name is Jung Ki Seok. I am very happy to share my experiences and practices with you. Since we do not have much time, so I will just to jump into the main topic. Actually, I don't like these pictures of me. Anyhow, so there will be before Corona and after Corona. But for the KCDC, there is before MERS and after MERS. The case for the KCDC, it is a totally different before and after MERS. Actually, the capability of the step of KCDC remains the same, but the awareness of the public and the investment and support from the central government has changed dramatically. At the early of 2016, after the crisis of the MERS, I joined the KCDC because for a couple of months, the head of KCDC was empty. So since I joined the K, uh, I worked for the KCDC for one and a half years, and I have done a lot of work. Let's uh, take a look into a couple of things that I have done. First of all, uh, I established the Emergency Operations Center, which is the control tower of the COVID-19. And the head of the Emergency Operations Center back then was Jung Eun-kyung, who is the current head of the KCDC. 
and also we enhance epidemic intelligence service. And actually, this was considered very important in the USA KCDC. But here in Korea, it was not considered important. Anyone can take care of the EIS, EIS but we strengthened the system. So the registered nurse and the specialized doctors and certified doctors are leading this service. And we clearly understand how important the risk communication is. The professor Park Kisu is here with us anyhow. He was working together with me back then, so we opened the risk communication office. During the MERS crisis, I learned that since I am working in the respiratory disease, respiratory patients, I don't get any information about the patients. So what I look at that is that before having that kind of disease, we have to have some kind of you know cautions or some alerts before having the actual disease. But we are not communicating or delivering and exchanging any information. So we signed the MOU with the Korea Medical Associations. So we deliver every information to the doctors across the country. And that information is limited to the inf infectious disease. Because doctors are not opening up the emails or some other mails, so we are the texting doctors. So we also strengthen the hospital transmission MG management. And so that that's why we are improving the visiting sick person culture. And we also reinforce DUR, which is the drug utilization review. And we also strengthen smart quarantine system. I will get back to these points later on. This is the organizational chart. As you can see in the diagram, we created a new strat a new organizations such as Strategic Planning for EID and Center for Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response. This is the center which plays a critical role to develop and distribute new diagnosis kit. And the Center for Laboratory Control of Infectious Disease is also new structure. And the Center for Infectious Disease Research under the National Institute of Health is also a new, new structure. This is the detailed division of the CPHCPR. And the first division is a public health emergency and bioterrorism. Second, quarantine support. And third is a resource management, which is largely providing some supplies and the equipment. And the fourth is a risk assessment and international cooperation. Last but not least, emerging infectious disease and response. And the emergency operation center was opened last May. It is a pretty good and well established. It was very small one in the past, but it has expanded and well equipped. This is, as you can see, this is kind of a control tower. There is a meeting room and a press room in the back. This is a layout of the EOC. Actually, those who are working in the EOC are toiling for more than 100 days due to the COVID-19. This is a smart quarantine system that we completed 2017. But as you are well aware, quarantine is not enough to find out the first case of the COVID-19. When we just find out the first case, we feel a little relieved, but the many more confirmed cases are rushing in because there was no symptoms sometimes. That is one of the difficulties to identify that. If we are having the travelers coming in, then they are going to the quarantine stations at the international airport. And all the information will be shared to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Justice and Ministry of Welfare and Health. And the more important thing is that communications carriers uh, they are going to the carrier services and they to buy the roaming services. Then that communication carriers give us the information who are buying that roaming services. So by combining all that, then DUR 
and all the information will be registered to DUR, which stands for Drug Utilization uh, Review. This is the system where the doctors are checking if other doctors are prescribing certain drugs. So DUR, because doctors are using the DUR, they can see if the patient visited the Middle East. So by making most of the DUR, we can identify if the patient has been in the affected area, affected area or contaminated area. So we are collaborating with many different agencies together with uh, the clinical centers and KCBC. So we call it smart quarantine system. And from now on, I do like to summarize what, how everything happened here in Korea and uh, let me just uh, wrap it up with the evaluation. So actually this slide is very important because it shows how the KCDC has been responding from the first case to the, uh, from the first outbreak of Wuhan pneumonia in last, gen last December. Coincidentally, we didn't know uh, the Wuhan pneumonia outbreak in, in December, but KCDC had the map exercise back then. The scenario goes like that. There were unidentified pneumonia coming from China. And with that information, we conducted the risk assessment and then prepared the response guidelines to distribute to the local government and the medical centers. And then the Ministry of Justice and the the quarantine stations inform people who visited China of respiratory disease caution. Actually, back then, even China authorities announced that there was no human-to-human -human transmission. Actually, that was a big mistake of China. And then we activated the DUR for the medical centers to check if their patient had visited uh, the Wuhan. And the more important thing is to establish the pan-corona pan test methodology. Pan-corona is to identify any corona-related disease because China didn't announce what kind of uh, viruses that is. So we tried to find out all types of coronaviruses. There were six coronaviruses, MERS corona, a common corona, uh, that's actually very routine test that have been carried out as very general chronic. So pan corona means we are testing six different coronas. If every six viruses were negative, then it should be the seventh a new corona. So that is that turned out SARS coronavirus two. And at the end of January, they, we got the genome sequencing and based on that we developed uh, the diagnosis kit and then the all we declare a state of caution which is the second lowest out of the alert system and we identify the first case January 21st let's just sum up from the first case to 29th case as soon as he was identified, he was hospitalized to negative pressure room. And the KCDC identified the confirmed case and contact tracing and hospitalization and isolation. They have been practicing this kind of drills constantly. They are controlling 200 MERS patients every year because they have been in the negative pressure rooms. So from the moment they were, they are hospitalized to discharge it, they are controlling and managing everything. So they are very accustomed to, to this kind of processes. They just are doing uh, the processes of identification to the isolation as usual. And the alert level has been escalated by one level to alert. It is, you know, the, that alert system should go one step further than the current situation. Once the alert, alert is declared,
then the central accident measure center will be open. It will be had headed by the Ministry of Health and Welfare. So there will be two control towers, one led by KCDC and the other led by the Ministry of Health and Welfare. So since there are two heads, sometimes these two heads are ignoring each other. That is a very critical issue. And the 29th case was found out, but we didn't understand the reason and the route to how he got confected. He turned out to have pneumonia, but the doctor who uh, treat him said it is not the general pneumonia, but the Wuhan pneumonia. And so the 29th case can be considered as the beginning or signal of the community transmission, but we don't see the signal clearly. And finally, we are having the 31st cases. The 31st case actually paralyzed all the medical institutions of that area. They, Daegu, has, Daegu is very proud of the medical system because they have five university hospitals and they have all different levels of medical institutions. But since, thanks, because of the 31st cases, all that infrastructure of medical system infrastructure has been paralyzed. You know, so the experts, including myself, argue that when we saw the 31st case, we argue that all the patients and all the government officials in the table should be amplified. I think it's it's really fine to evacuate all the inpatients of the hospitals in Daegu area, but they didn't take any actions. You know, once the patient shows arrest, if you do the CPR, it's not working. It, the, the same thing happens in the medical system and infrastructure in Daegu. Actually, the Daegu city government should have two epidemiological surveyors, but they didn't have that one because in normal days, they, do not, they don't have a lot of work to that. So the one step from the KCDC said that he has no idea where to start. And the alert has been escalated to serious, belatedly. That serious alert should be declared when they identify 31st case right away before it has become serious community transmissions. I believe there must be a very strong reasons not to do it behind it. And then we are now coming into the distancing in daily lives. So Prime Minister is taking leadership to control the Daegu, and also we opened the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters, which is headed by the Prime Minister. So we waged an all-out war to calm down Daegu Gyeongbuk regions, and it seems like everything calms down. But then we are having the sporadic cluster transmission in Itaewon, May 18th. Because it happened while we are having social distancing practices, so that's how it goes. And let's evaluate how well we are doing. So first, let's begin with the positive feedback. The Jung Eun Kyung, head of KCDC, as you are well aware, has become the symbol and icon of security and trust. You know, for the past three months, she is doing the daily briefing. She is really trustworthy. And the transparently, information has been disclosed and shared. So this is the current situation. So we recommend you to do these kind of things. There is nothing to hide. And as you can see and guess, all the steps from the Ministry of Health and Welfare and the KCDC have dedicated dramatically. 
those who are shuttled between Seoul and Sejong or Osong these days are staying in Osong and Sejong area to work hard to settle down the, that, the, the situation. And also general public understand that public interest to can come first before privacy protection sometimes, is in particular in the race, in the run up to the crisis. And also, we are doing pretty good job to identify the case and also contact tracing. We even disclose all the information who are sharing certain info, certain spaces like elevators and every detailed information. So because we established the diagnosis test system early on, we can secure pen corona, RT PCR kit, and press to track. So we already have all the systems in place. So we turn out to have a very superior quarantine system. But still, there are improvements we can make further. And is it right to uh, is it right for the KCDC to play the major major role of the quarantine? Well, it's worth to consider because all the policies related to the quarantine can be prepared by KCDC, but it can it's it's worth to think about. And also, you know, we we are now wearing the mask in the the subway, but that should be done much earlier. You know, because we didn't ask people to wear the mask in mass transportation, but now suddenly we are asking people to wear the mask after we are releasing from the social distancing to the distancing in daily lives. So not many are following that. And the decision of the opening up of the school that is sometimes not enough and not relevant. You know, today is actually reopening day for the high school, but you know, some we found many numbers of confirmed cases in Incheon, so we closed the schools again. So it's not a very good. And even in here in Korea, people have died before getting into the hospitals. That's unacceptable. If we can evacuate all the condominiums and resorts and uh, dormitories of universities to accommodate all the patients, but they didn't take that action timely, that's something we feel unfortunate. That should be led by the authorities of the quarantine. Actually, the things that keep Korea safe is wearing the mask, my personal opinion, but I believe a mask plays a critical role to keep Korea safe. As the other speaker mentioned that, we have to share data. There is a platform. If you just register the information there, then we can, we can share all the information. There are data about 10,000 people, but not all data are up uploaded and registered. And so that all high quality quarantine related information can be shared. Last but not least, KCDC is not all about infectious disease. infectious disease. They are also taking care of chronic disease. The, it is a center, but center is not enough. They cannot enact any laws. They cannot set up any policies. They have to escalate to the ministry or administration. We have to empower the KCDC better. And also, they have to collaborate and cooperate with the R&D center to go in the right direction. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very accurate depiction of the current status. Now we listen to three different presentations, and we're about to start a um, discussion session. 
with the previous three speakers and two more discussants. Before we proceed with the discussion, we would like to hear from two discussants. The first discussant today is Hong Jun Park. Currently, he chairs the Seoul Medical Association and also vice president of the Medical Association Korea. I'm sure his face is familiar since he appeared on TV a few times. Now I would like to listen from him about the current status. Please give a big hand. Nice to meet you, ladies and gentlemen. From Korea Medical Association's perspective, of course, it, in, it is quite early to evaluate our response, but I would say it's more like an interim report or evaluation on what uh, we have been doing. The Korea Medical Association is the only legal entity that represents the Medical Society of Korea. In the US, they have AMA. In, in Korea, we have KMA. So I would like to speak on behalf of our association. As I mentioned earlier, it is uh, it sh this should not be called a evaluation. It's more like a review on what we have been doing. In a crisis, open and transparent information sharing is most important. Just like uh, the director Chung Eun Kyung at KCDC and the Healthcare Institute's representative have been carrying out briefings for the general public and ordinary citizens. And I believe that they have been winning trust from our citizens for sure by doing so. Now I would like to move on to a somewhat negative measure that have been taking place. Just like what uh, infectious disease specialists have been recommending, namely lockdown, shutdowns, the Medical Association thinks our response was not adequate. The Medical Association of Korea has been emphasizing the importance of effective control of the inflow of overseas cases. Even though we have been delivered our opinion through media appearance, the government has not been taking heed to our recommendation, which is very regretful. And there are different grades of uh, alarms when it comes to disastrous crises, and it took a while for us to raise the awareness. We have been carrying out diverse discussions with the Seoul Metro government, the Metropolitan Government, and also other uh, government entities. But I believe that we weren't preemptive enough when it comes to controlling and cutting the inflow. And the Medical Association carried out a nationwide campaign early March. We said, for the first week of March, let's just stay inside the house in order to fully carry out social distancing. However, the government uh, started this campaign 20 years, uh, 20 days later, which is considered to be too late. And the second um, aspect is the absence of control tower. We have been emphasizing on this multiple times from the beginning. There were miscoordination between local governments, central governments, and other entities, including hospitals, which created a great deal of confusion. And I also want to point out the government and political movements as well. Private public cooperation was vital when it comes to fighting against the virus. And there have been many different stages of the development of the crisis. And we witness many discrepancies between the government response and the reality and the development of a virus. 
the exchange and sharing of clinical information and data. For example, let's, there, let's say there was a death case. And what does this death mean from a medical perspective? This information was not shared to physicians in a quickly manner. So physicians on the site were not able to utilize that vital information. And there are data uh, appearing on how many people have died because people are interested about how many people are dying. But I think there has been no uh, in-depth um, support and research and data gathering on intensive care unit patients, even though we made relevant suggestions. And in the uh, actual task force operation, the medical association was excluded from the operation, which is very sad. We, uh, and also, in early April, when uh, five days in a row there were no patients, the government and media said that our initial response was successful and they encouraged uh, people to go back to their normal daily lives. But I believe this was too early to enjoy the festivity mood. And if you think about what kinds of partnership the government and the medical association had, there was a um, discussion between the two organizations when it comes to the leaders of the two organizations. But when it comes to working level cooperation, I believe that we have been working closely and seamlessly in a practical level. Um, the CDC, KCDC, recommended um, us to have an overview of all patient cases, and the Medical Association uh, made an order to our participants and members uh, so that they can produce a accurate medical record. Seoul Metropolitan Government also cooperated with health o public health offices around the city in order to operate drive-through and walk-through test locations. And even today, many um, physicians under our association are engaging in voluntary activities. If you think about Daegu Dongsan Hospital, that specific location played a key role when it comes to hosting um, seriously ill patients. And I believe that that practice alone reduced a great number of casualties. And this was actually initiated by our med association. We suggested this idea to the government, and it was accepted, and the result was positive. And I cannot emphasize more about how important initial response is. And secondly, communication with the general public has been very successful. The government's briefing and communication, of course, very successful. However, there, the government's res uh, communication with the medical association, I believe it was not adequate. There has been a um, there has been a communication. However, it was more unilateral. They have been telling us what to do or informing us about what is going on. They did not include us, the medical association, as a member of the COVID-19 task force. And political decision has to be made based on scientific and medical information. 
but I believe that the government focused more on their political and administrative preferences and priorities. And the thanks to you challenge, which has been active, was mostly initiated by the government. And this was more for um, relieving the atmosphere in the public realm instead of based on communication with expert knowledge and professionals. We've also witnessed that the public administration and public medical system collapsing due to um, this inefficient operation of government organizations. There are many issues uh, being raised. For example, controlling the number of graduating doctors. And I believe that this government in intervention should stop. Thank you. And the second discussion is Professor Jung Sun Yong of Seoul National University Hospital. And despite of the Daegu serious situation of Daegu, the reason why we are still keeping the medical system is that we are having the creating the community treatment center. There is the community treatment center in Mungyong, Daegu. He was the leader and the leading the community treatment center there. So he will ex share his experiences. Since we do not have much time left, I'd just like to begin my presentation right away. I actually show you the pictures, so you can just uh, take it very casually. Bungyong Community Treatment Center, or CTC, the 80 patients out of 100, the COVID-19 patients are mild or asymmetrical, and the other 20% are showing various symptoms. To treat the 20% serious cases, we need to take care of the other 80% who shows no symptom or light symptom. That is why we are creating community treatment center. My hospital has been ready and prepared for this kind of facilities, and this is the third CTC in the region. We want to open this center when we are fully equipped. That is why we have become third center, but we have prepared for this center much earlier. And its operation has begun early March. And our, you know, the dormitory, which has been used as our the human resources training center has turned into a kind of a hospital which can accommodate about 100 hundred patients. And the doctors have been uh, dispatched from the Seoul National University hospitals and also governments from all around the world are working, all around the country have been working together. So it has become one good example. So the principles of operation is that the first is to separate the movement of a patient clearly and perfectly separated from those of our medical staff. And also we have established the unpacked treatment to protect not only patients, but also medical staff and uh, their caregivers. And once the patients have admitted into the center, there is a little shuttle bus. And the shuttle bus has x-ray equipment. So every patient should take their thoracic images. Once they do not have any symptoms in the respiratory system and the lung, then they can be admitted into the center. Then they will be diagnosed with the doctor preliminary and then finally um, get into the, the patient room. This is the table.
table, it really is divided the KCDC. So our center only received asymmetrical and mild cases. We thoroughly comply with the regulations and the guidelines of the KCDC. So there is a monitoring system operated by KCDC, and our center also is having very similar control centers. Every alleys and con the elevators for the ward of patients have been monitored and controlled by the CCTV. We didn't install any CCTV inside the patient's room, and the medical doctors from the Seoul National University Hospitals. Also, we are uh, having a lot different steps coming from the firefighting center and the government agencies. So we delivered the training for them. So the patient's room, as you can see in the media, in the picture, each patient's room are having all different equipment for them to do some self-diagnosis. They can check their temperatures and they can check their body pressure and they can update the information to a certain system for us to see. And we also prepared this kind of kit. The red tent is the walk-through screening center. People can just walk through in this center to get tested. This is the treatment process. Once they are getting in, they can they have to take the thoracic images first. And there are some imaging data they can get from other hospitals they have been to before. Then we can refer to that imaging and that images will be interpreted by the hospitals in Seoul. And according to the procedures of discharging, if they are meeting the criteria and standard of discharging, then they are discharged. And there is a monitoring center in Seoul and in the, on the site. So doctors are visiting the patients twice a day and doctors are checking the patients every other day. Seoul and Mungyeong are traveled by the shuttle bus. So the test of a coronavirus sample, uh, the, the sample of the coronavirus patients have been delivered to the Seoul, and the Seoul hospitals have tested and delivered the result to us. And we have established a certain network to, to facilitate the communications and the diagnosis. So the existing treatment system that we are using in the hospitals in Seoul are also applied to the Mungyeong CTC. We do not have much time to deliver a separate software system, so we just use existing uh, chatting applications named KakaoTalk to have a video call. So by using all these kind of means, we are we are interpreting the images. These are the kind of the online blatting boards for doctors to see all the patient's condition at all once. And some patients are having some Bluetooth function embedded uh, equipment to check their vital signs. They can check their uh, blood pressures and heart rates and many other key vital signs. They can upload upload such data onto certain system by themselves. And we did surveys and the all all that things have been interlinked to the systems of the hospital. Everything can be done by using the cell phone. So the patients in the Bungyeong CTC can be treated by doctor in Seoul, hospitals in Seoul, by via the telephone call or the video call. So as I mentioned earlier, nurses check nurses nurses are checking the patients twice a day, while doctors are checking patients every other day. 
and we have also many other CTC across the country. So we are able to treat about 9,000 patients per year. We have surveyed the satisfactory satisfaction level of patients, and largely they are very happy about their services. We have to have on-text uh, treatment to, due to the infectious disease and to minimize the hospital transmissions. But the issue is that if problem, if if there is any serious situation happened, it is not possible to have actual physical treatment. Once our patient develops the symptoms, then the government officials who is working in the center are wearing the protective gear to get into patient room to get diagnosis and deliver treatment. That's it. Thank you. Now let's um, get into the discussion session. I would like to invite the three previous speakers and also two discussants onto the stage. Because we are behind the schedule, I would like to ask everyone to briefly answer the questions. Uh, let me first ask a question, and I think Dr. Lee and Dr. G can answer this one. I think um, people have been curious m the most about whether China has been submitting enough materials and documents to the WHO. What do you think? Let me begin first. And Dr. Li actually has visited to China himself. He, I think he has a lot to share. The, the China has made the presentation via the EC. If you look at the presentation materials, as I mentioned in my presentation, a lot of data have been revealed. So according to the IHR, they have to report to WHO within 24 hours. But actually, they are belatedly reporting to WHO. Many suspect that. I'm not sure what is right, but the information that I have received at the IHR is a pretty high quality, but I'm not sure how much earlier they have to report to WHO because it is a little unclear because a nation sometimes cannot be sure when and how they have to report to WHO. So each country has a different decision-making process. So according to their own criteria and standard, some countries take a little longer time to make that decision to report to WHO. But based on the data that I have received back then, they are revealed a lot. Oh, what do you think, Dr. Lee, because you have visited the site, the location? Well, it, I think we have to look at it whether um, as whether critical information was included in the material and document or not. Just like how we have not been gathering um, data on the disease, I think it, the same goes for China. When we were diagnosing this first, it was considered pneumonia. And when you are diagnosing pneumonia, you generally do not take CT scanning or chest x-rays. So when the US CDC uh, was noted about this case, the WHO first visited um, the Wuhan location. And according to Chinese CDC's report, December 8th was when the first case patient appeared. And while doing the carrying out the investigation, 
only half the patients were related to the wet market, the so-called wet market, and the rest, the remaining half, uh, were the patients where they had no idea where they got the disease. And um, during the week of joint declaration and report, the number of patients soared. So I believe that when it comes to interpreting the initial data, there was that was something that was problematic. At that time, we could not derive a conclusion. What we were interested back then was what caused the city of Wuhan to be locked down and what kind of measures were taken by the government. We carried out a great deal of discussions and we looked, tried to extract the most useful data from the documents. So this is how we decided to carry, uh, come up with community treatment centers. We knew that 80% of the cases were normal and new, and 20% were uh, critical, and about 5% were fatal or lethal. And because we gathered data on natural deaths when there was no medical intervention, we had a academic and medical background to create community treatment centers in Daegu. If we hadn't had this information, I believe that we also might have had to shut down and lock down all the societal functions. First, I wanted to know why there were so many uh, household infections and why some uh, demographic groups did not catch and ca catch the virus as much as other um, groups. And on uh, January 23rd, when Wuhan uh, shut down, patients could not come out of the city. And other cities only had imported cases, just like what happened in Korea. And most imported cases were uh, done at around 1,000 uh, or 15,000 and at designated centers and um, and hospitals, the patients with fever were isolated. And as when we were looking at this Chinese practice, we thought that maybe a thousand or fifteen thousand patients would be able to be handled properly by our capabilities. But there was a, a huge blow up, and we wanted to know how we're going to quarantine and isolate these patients when the number of cases was soaring and snowballing. So we were um, going back and forth whether we're going to focus on serious patients or do the um, complete shutdown or lockdown. So we uh, quickly implemented the Wuhan model. For example, a week later after a patient is found, then we can, we just uh, believe that that week is enough for us to contain everything. What we learned from China is the natural death scenarios and why health impacts were so huge that the city had to be shut down. These two are very uh, were useful and um, these were enough to be shared and to be helpful to other countries. But when it comes to how initial patients were actually made and derived, we do not know. We had a uh, we could not have enough access because once you go into the city of Wuhan, you can go not come back out. A few people went in, but most of the cases we received information through teleconferences. And the reason why we could not get enough information about initial patient data was because they did not know the characteristics of patients enough either. So there is a clear a uh, threshold between whether this is an infectious disease or just a conventional pneumonia the the time and the threshold was very blurry from in the beginning we did not have capability to diagnose this as an infectious disease we just thought this was a general and conventional pneumonia there was a lot of confusion in the beginning So if you think about most diagnosis um, scenarios and standards, 
I think I can see that the Chinese government and CDC have put a lot of efforts to create materials and documents that could be used in other areas as well, government officials as well. But from our perspective, we just hope that, and we also wish that they share more and also share accurate data. And in uh, mid-February, that's when Chinese CDC announced and disclosed overall data, comprehensive data. But I hope that if this timing was a little bit earlier, other countries might have responded better. Would you like to ask a question to Professor Zhong Gisok? So in your presentation, actually the head of the KCDC is in a situation, is, is in a difficult situation to give a comment or to recommend something to the other head or minister of other agencies. Then from how the KCDC will be the playing a role as a control tower from what perspective and how the KCDC, based on the scientific evidences, can promote the letter better. Would you please share your opinion? Actually, I have that thought all the time. Let me be very succinct. You know, when it comes to the government officials, the title and position is everything. You know, to control everything about the infectious disease, we have to create the vice president of the quarantine. Otherwise, the KCDC cannot play a relevant role. You know, they talk about that all the time to isolate the center of the CDC center to the ministry or the administration. But they never, never escalate it. And they don't allocate the relevant, you know, the empowerment and the budget to the head of the KCDC. It should be escalated to the Department of Health, just like many other countries. Otherwise, the head of the KCDC never have any proper power. Actually, you know, the head of KCDC is argued to be the vice minister, but vice minister of other ministry, but it is not the case. Um, I believe the medical expertise contributed a lot when it comes to overcoming the current crisis. And I believe that there will be um, a huge deal of economic loss and damage to different hospitals. Do you know how we're going to overcome this damage? Or it was more of a voluntary and humanitarian approach. Uh, we are still discussing this matter with the government. Um, the government is providing support. But the support that we receive as a medical uh, official is a little bit, um, could feel a little bit difficult. And um, before all this, as a physician, we have an instinct where we want to contribute to um, the public health. So many physicians did not even think about economic benefits when this crisis occurred. They just wanted to go and be on site and to be there for um, patients. And uh, if I share some examples of m my colleague, even though it was going to um, cause many economic uh, damages and loss to my colleague, he just left his clinic and went directly to Daegu. So now it's time for us to think about the cooperation between private and public medical systems. And this partnership can play a key role in fighting against the crisis. Even though uh, we have just passed the sec first wave, and we're still preparing for the second wave. And during this time, the government and the Korea Medical Association should be close partners to come up with a coordinated and consistent response measure. People have say, have been saying that this pandemic will hit the world every four to five years. We need to come up with a measure. So to Professor Jung Soon-yong, the Mungyong Community Treatment Center, you said 9,000 were treated at the CDC, CTC. 
and how many doctors and the medical staff that have been dispatched to that center. And if we do, didn't use such kind of a facility, then how much loss do we would do expect? Actually, the on-contact treatment doesn't does require a lot of medical steps. It only saves the resources for the traveling. So when it comes to the time and efforts to make to make an investment in the treatment, actually we put much bigger efforts to deliver the on tech treatment. There were two specialized doctors at the center and we got the two doc two the training doctors from the medical center and also from the main hospitals in Seoul. One or more doctors have been always participants in the diagnosis, video conferencing diagnosis. Actually, because they are under the isolation, so the psychological doctors also support them to keep the mental health. So instead of improving the efficiency of the treatment, it is improving the accessibility for the patients. Actually, we are not saving any resources at the hospital. Thank you. Uh, there are some questions that we gathered from online. Can you um, put those questions on the screen? So it says that Korea has been uh, carrying out more tested tests than other countries. How do you bear the burden of the cost? And also, how do you um, be prepped before the infectious disease occur? And also, how efficient and how effective these uh, mathematical prediction models can play a role when it comes to dealing with infectious diseases? These are three questions. I think we should be able to answer the third question in the next session. Maybe uh, the first and second questions are relevant. So how do you bear the burden? Who bears the burden? According to the Infectious Disease Act, this is uh, level one, but the government has to pay for the cost. If the government uh, is imposing mandatory testing, then the government has to pay for it. However, um, so for uh, uh, the money where patients have to pay out of their pockets, the government is going to be handling that. But f because uh, if they're they have and they own uh, insurance programs and plans, then the insurance government insurance companies also uh, share the burden as well. Uh, for the government, 60% is from the healthcare ministry and also National, Na National Disaster Center uh, takes care of 40%. Well, the second question, it's this is very vague and abstract. What do you, um, can you interpret this question? I think it's coming from a a medical perspective. So when a number of patients come to hospitals, how do you respond and prepare? Um, if you think about the government, uh, after biological terrors appeared in 2000, we have been accumulating medi relevant medicine in a warehouse. For example, Tamiflu and many different types of antibiotics were uh, stored in warehouses. And after the MERS outbreak, there uh, has been an, uh, a procurement for PPE. If you think about um, oxygen masks and artificial respirators, we are going to, we have a plan to have those in stock as well. Move on to the next. And what is the success factor to the current to quarantine system? And some questions about the Sweden, a Sweden herd community, and also there is no vaccines or the therapeutics. And what other measures we can take regardless of the social distancing? I think we have covered a lot for the first question. In case of Sweden, they said they will 
they they want they didn't say they are testing the hard community but actually they are testing hard community in real any one of you can mm -hmm. talk about anything about flood and rain as you are well aware influenza can be treated by the herd community in the 2009 and 2010. RGO value was 1.245, roughly speaking. So 30 to 33 percent of the population can be vaccinated. So 24 million vaccines should be prepared to vaccinate it largely starting from the child and infants. The herd community is possible when we are having the antibody. But we don't know if this disease can be treated by herd community. Even though we are having herd, communi herd immunity, it's not easy to protect a certain individual or a certain demographic group by herd community. The reason why they are failing in Sweden is, is that actually there is some the community transmission in nursing home, things like that. And here in Korea, we didn't have a shutdown. And, but there is an additional thing we are doing is contact tracing and isolation. I think uh, that's where we are doing better. And the social distancing and other PHI are all similar to the other countries. So this disease has not been proven to be treated by the herd, herd immunity because no one knows who gonna be vulnerable to this disease. And the second thing is that it's highly likely to have a huge number of patients. And if 20% of them are going into the intensive care unit, then no single system can accommodate it. So contact tracing and isolation are the two most effective measures. But one thing we have to consider is that whether they are they whether they are sustainable. So we have to give thoughts on that. Because we do not have any medicines and vaccines, so how long and how big we can maintain these kind of measures. And at the same time, the new normal such as social distancing or some other real new model should be created. Once we are establishing new normal, then instead of depending on the herd immunity, the current measures would be better and stable. Now, if you think, look at the third question, it says it's um, individual hygiene and also social distancing that are effective, but are there any other ways that we can take? And if I change this question in a different format, um, vaccine development and treat cure development, how long do we have to wait more to see these? What do you think? Can you expect what time it'll be? Well, um, Dr. Anthony Fauci in the U.S. said uh, it's likely and it's um, going to be in place within this year, which is a positive forecast. Even when um, development is going smoothly, actual use and uh, the access for everyone in the world, this is a challenge. We do not know whether it will be distributed to all of the people that need this because there's development phase and there's production phase and there's also distribution phase. So I don't know when it will be where everyone who needs it can secure the vaccine and treatment. So it's definitely a challenging task. And as of now, today, what's important is that our country, Korea, makes our own vaccination and treatment. But I don't think this process is, is going very um, fast in a speedy manner. Vaccine is definitely going to take more time, but treatment, there are many options through reposition. So for the ones who are actually caught it, I think when it comes to treatment, we have a positive, more positive outlook. Professor Zhang, do you have any comment? I heard that there were more questions coming up.
The human rights would be the obstacle to be the international standards. I think that, that would be the topic during the second session. So you can find the answers from the second session. And uh, what do you take the pride most from the, our the results of the current quarantine? And you know, not only the medical staff, but also the general citizens are tired of this kind of measures as the coronavirus becomes prolonged. And uh, what kind of protections we are giving to the medical staff? Actually, the primary and secondary and tertiary medical situations are having difficulties. And the tertiary hospitals found confirmed cases from yesterday and today as well. Actually, this is not an issue, can be resolved by the hospitals by itself, but the, the whole society, including the citizens and the general public, should pay attention to and be interested in to find a resolution to that. So the Korea Medical Association is highly interested in this, in this, this uh, question, and we are very cautious to keep our medical system not to be collapsed because of the tiresome and the fatigue. And many are expecting the second wave will come in the coming fall, then how we can respond to that? And if and it is relevant to give the messages to stay at home if you feel like fever. So we are having discussions over it, and we have established a multiple number of committees under our association, we will do our best to, to come up with the best solutions for the interest of general public. Mm. Um, well, of course, um, fatigue has been accumulated, and physicians and doctors have a responsibility to contribute to society. So we naturally accept our uh, accountability and our share but I think the trust on medical officials have increased greatly from our general citizens. And we also um, see many donation to medical professionals from citizens, and many people have been vocal about how they uh, are thankful for the sacrifice of physicians, so we will work harder. Thank you very much. And let's go to the question in the middle. It said, what do you want to promote the most to overseas about Korea's uh, response measures? I want to promote the most is that as all of the one on the stage can share is that we have developed and established the diagnostic system as early as possible. Under the discussion with the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety, we take on emergency actions to build up the network for the testing of the diagnosis kit. I think that's the one we take the biggest pride of. And the USA say that they are Doing the test, the biggest number, but it's a little bit related. So I think that's uh, one of the best results that I want to take pride of. Actually, we have a lot of questions, and much of them can be answered by the experts who are sitting on the stage. But we are running out of the time. So now we'd like to wrap up the first session. And the second session will be resumed 4.15. We will get back to you very soon. Thank you.
Now we would like to resume the second session for coronavirus pandemic, Korea's response and measures. We are going to have a discussion and presentations on civil society's response against COVID-19. The first speaker of the second session is um, Seoul National University National Strategy Committee Chairman, Mr. Chun Young Hong. I feel like we're running out of time. I'll make sure that my presentation is uh, very concise and brief. The presentation that I'm in charge of is healthcare state and private public cooperation when it comes to pandemic responses. The first thing I would like to emphasize is the importance of public and pri uh, private partnership. Even though uh, we have um, carried out government measures to tackle the crisis, if we did not have civil society's voluntary uh, support, we would not have been able to overcome the threat crisis. And next, this is not going to be the end of the crisis. This will be a consistent attack to our so society. And uh, we have to uh, become a health care state, which is already rising. This is inevitable. Healthcare states are going to emerge. And in such healthcare states, um, public health care systems are more important more than anything. But if you think about our systems and policies, there is still a long way for us to go. The third aspect is the problem of resources. Medical resources are limited when there is a lack of time and resources. The cooperation between public and uh, private sectors is and becomes more in important. In order to overcome this ongoing crisis, sustainable governance is important. We need governance, not the government in this area. So now let's go to the materials that I prepared for the rest of the presentation. This is the result of the public-private partnership. We carried out three T strategies. The reason why we were able to uh, achieve success here was because there was a timely cooperation between medical areas and the government, R&D and the test kit development, mock trainings, and on-site response measures were implemented in a very timely manner. And thanks to this accumulation of experiences and practices, even though there were uh, mistakes and errors, we were able to be fair better. And there was some creative and interesting um, measures implemented as well. For example, um, ICT-based tracking measures could be a good case in point, even though it was continuously improving, it was still there in place. And also, voluntary activities were very helpful. If you think about Korea, I, we didn't, I didn't think that Korea was a big nation for uh, volunteers. Instead of thinking about their own uh, physical health, medical officials all flocked to the city of Daegu to help the city's public health care. And uh, I would like to talk about treat community treatment centers as well. The introduction of community treatment center was very important when it comes to um, preventing the collapse of medical system of Korea. And also, Dr. Chung said, if we had to follow all the uh, administrative orders and rules, so many casualties would have occurred. The fast-paced government support was important and necessary. There were some issues as well. Hundreds of uh, people who were mandated to be self-quarantined 
did not follow government order and direction. And if you look at slide 10 to slide 14, uh, these slides are mainly about the big state that is going to emerge due to the COVID-19 crisis. But because we're running out of time, I'll skip this part over. Going to slide 16, this is about a core of the course. Many experts have been voicing the same um, scenario. Countries are going to become a health care state. And if you cannot avoid this trend and journey, you have to think about what characteristics and features have to be equipped by each nation. So from slide 17, it talks about required modules of a health care state. And it also talks about organizations, resources, and tools and policy measures. You can also read uh, these parts on your own as well, in the interest of time. And in a health healthcare state, the government has to take the leadership, of course. But a precondition for that is the partnership between private and public sectors. Civil society, awareness is what's important. And we cannot buy this with money. Money should, will not buy. Um, money will not do to secure those uh, voluntary activities from general citizens. But we have to be able to provide incentives to them so that they can constantly be interested, interested in um, sharing their resources for the society. And there's also a privacy issue and ethics issues and um, social economical issues that were posed to the Korean society. We also can think about uh, the intervention of the government. But I would say the biggest threat in a health care state is that it could be too interventionary. And this might um, threaten democracy in our society. And when it comes to responding this matter, civil society responses and capability building are very important. Moving on to slide 25. The reason why Korea has been uh, successfully dealing with COVID-19 was, of course, because of the lessons we learned from the MERS crisis. But I think we were pretty lucky. It was almost like an art. Uh, one of the important factors is the public and private partnership. Even though we cannot go back to the past uh, realm, we can still cope with this crisis in a creative way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. And we're going to have our next presentation by Dr. Myung-hee Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim is leading People's Health Institute, and she has been carrying out multiple research on medical practices even before the current crisis. Please give her a big hand. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Myung Hee Kim. As introduced, I majored in prevention um, diseases, and I also uh, majored in studying um, diseases, and especially diseases related to uh, social issues. Uh, that is why I would like to talk about social issues and what kind of roles that the civil society can play in the future. If you think about an infectious disease, just like many uh, previous speakers have mentioned, there are uh, many healthcare issues that are intertwined that cannot be uh, clearly interpreted or explained. There is a great deal of uncertainty, and you can never perfectly, perfectly control the infectious diseases. That is why communication is of most important. 
And when it comes to freedom and um, freedom, inequality uh, plays a role. We have to think about medical preparedness as well as socioeconomic um, issues as well. When, um, if you think about when we reach herd immunity, you will be able to benefit from the formation of herd immunity. That is why this should not be approached as an individual uh, perspective, but social approach is more important. In that sense, individual benefit and social benefit have to take uh, keep a balance between one another. If you think about the WHO responses, uh, they emphasized on communication on danger. You see some red set, uh, marks on my slide over here. You have to clearly communicate what the government knows and what the government uh, has not understood yet. I w what I want to focus on is when it comes to risk communication, it's not merely a form of communication. Communication itself should not be the end. What I mean by this is that when we're responding to pandemic and healthcare crises, it is not um, so much about clinical studies. It's more like social um, arbitration. And social arbitration has characteristics uh, that cannot be witnessed in a lab. People have to actively participate. Just because you have a plan called A, this is not going to be accurately executed in a local government. Because it is social arbitration and social intervention, the government alone cannot prevent the crisis. Civil society and uh, general citizens have to participate to effectively carry out response measures. That is why governance is necessary. Governance has many different meanings. First, governance itself can bring up efficiency. Even if you are a, an expert in different um, areas and fields of studies, you do not know, and it's impossible for you to understand, everything about something that we've never experienced. And once knowledge is posed and um, suggested and presented by officials, uh, when uh, civil society and citizens can fully understand this, the government me measures and medical measures become more um, effective. And it also has a great advantage of relieving social discrepancy and polarization. We are now living in a democratic society, and democracy is something that uh, that is not stopped. Uh, we have to constantly work on this and work for this. We have to understand uh, the crisis, and the existence of citizens who would like to understand the crisis better is a great asset for democracy. Now, when it comes to building uh, risk governance, it's not just about the government doing something very well. Civil society has to participate. You should be able to criticize one another, also uh, be able to work uh, with one another. CSO plays a big role in that sense. According to definition of CSO, it's a civil society organization that's non state not for profit, it's separated from the government. It's an independent organization. I looked at different questions in the earlier session, and there was a question about why do you think Korea uh, carried out successful responses against uh, COVID-19? When I was writing for a foreign media in, uh, in April, I talked about the what contributed most when it comes to controlling the current situation was actually the civil society, the active participation of civil society. I can name some examples. If you think about immigrants, if you think about Singapore, it seemed that they were controlling very well. But in the immigrant society, uh, large uh, group cases and blow-ups were witnessed. And if you think about this, I don't know if you can see it well, but in on the slide, in the very initial stage of the crisis, the KCDC printed out 
many different languages uh, when it comes to making public notifications. And the communities, immigrant communities themselves, uh, created more diverse versions using more uh, languages so that people could understand better about what was going on. And their participation, immigrant society's participation, participated in the translation process and it contributed to uh, the Korea's response. And also, uh, there were many advocate groups who gave out help for uh, the disability, disabled people. Even if uh, products or goods were provided to them without people's help, they could not uh, survive and they could not um, fare well. However, in this uh, circumstance, there were voluntary groups who actually went there and helped the disabled with their own uh, resources. And the, their activities were carried out under the partnership with the government organizations. Uh, this uh, um, helped a lot when it comes to solving problems of massive um, breakouts in nursing homes and different facilities. And there was also a very uh, precarious a situation where uh, the COVID-19 breakout was related to social uh, sexual minorities. And these sexual minority groups came up with many different ideas about how they're going to protect their privacy as well as help the public to uh, avoid the massive con uh, con uh, spread of the virus. So all of the disciplines and measures were gathered by these individual groups and then they looked at um, the rules and they found loopholes and made suggestions and if you think about call center um, group infection cases on the site they talked about labor unions talked about how they're going to efficiently handle the cases they did independent research, investigation, and provide reports to the government as well. So um, labor unions consistently monitored how the government measures were actually delivered to the sites. And this does not apply to just Korea. International um, cooperation and collaborations are active as well. If you... Um, I don't know if you have heard this, but Lendesville was made by a company that is making um, cures for uh, rare diseases. And by uh, when you are designated as a rare disease cure developer, you can charge um, a huge amount of uh, money. You can charge a lot of uh, money from the people and patients. But there were um, criticism from the public that this medicine should not cost a lot to contribute to the resolution of the situation. The company decided to um, share this medicine with the poor and the marginalized as, that as well. And in the process, civil society's active voicing and opinion gathering helped a lot. And I believe that this efforts by uh, civil society was effective, for sure. And I have been talking fast because we're running out of time. But now I'm going to talk about what we're going to do in the future. Uh, the crisis that we're facing is not just a healthcare crisis. There are going to be social and economic impacts. And that is why the governance has to be made between CSO and other uh, social entities. Governance is not something to avoid the government's responsibility. When you're creating governance, of course, the government has to take the responsibility. And citizens are not just there for um, as a voluntary worker. They have to be communicating actively with government officials. 
and they have to find ways. They have to be trained with the government officials about how effectively they're going to carry out their services. They have to know what kind of civil organizations and, s and groups exist. Because if we don't know what kind of groups are out there, you will not be able to access them or uh, contact them in the case of crisis. And we have to um, provide support to civil groups in order to encourage civil participation. If there were no uh, groups, civil groups, um, helping the disabled, there it would not have been possible for the help to be coming out from the groups. That is why uh, while increasing the capabilities of um, civil groups in society, the government should provide necessary help and provide resources so that their strength can grow. And now I know that this uh, conference will be aired online to other um, citizens, basically for everyone. I want to ask you one thing. It's important for us to cooperate uh, with the government measures. But as a person, as an individual, we have to engage in multiple activities that can help other people. You can actually use your time, use your service, or you can make a voice. You're not just an individual. Use a, you are an individual that belongs to a society. This is uh, my conclusion. Thank you very much. Yeah, come on, Smith. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, this speaker, this time the presentation will be delivered by Professor Park Ki Su of Korea, Korea University. He used to be the spokesperson of the KCDC and the spokesperson of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. He might deliver very interesting presentations. And the topic is how the government is making the risk of communications in the COVID-19 crisis. Actually, one other professor said he doesn't like the pictures on the presentation, but this time, lucky, lucky, lucky me, I like the picture on the screen. I studied public communications, so I'd like to give you a brief introduction of these two areas. This is, today is the 20th of May. Five years ago today, Mars outbroke. Where should I? Okay, it's working now. Please turn the volume up. This is the headline. Five years ago, news coverage. We found the first two MERS cases, as Professor Jung Gi Suk mentioned earlier. Most people didn't know he was MERS patient, including the, even the hospitals didn't know that. So he has to visit many number of hospitals. So unintentionally, patients and hospitals see a lot of damages as well. So we learned the biggest lessons of MERS. Back then, many of the people who are responsible for this issue were were in a position to take a huge responsibilities and many has to leave forced to leave their job and so many things going in out and the MERS has been traveled to other countries from the Middle East and Korea is one of the countries who has the biggest confirmed cases. As a result of MERS, we had 186 confirmed cases and 91 were died and the fertility rate was 48.9%. Actually, the number is not that bad compared to the other countries. But today, I'd like to touch upon we made a failure in information disclosure. Because I was the biased spokesperson, so I can criticize what we have done wrong back then. We 
don't un we didn't understand the importance of information disclosure. We there was no consensus about the information disclosure. The information disclosure was not only to satisfy the right to know of the public, but by in by disclosing the information where the confirmed cases visited visited, so the other healthy people avoid to visit that area to keep themselves and their family members and colleagues from getting the virus. And people think as a result of non-disclosure of the information, people were panicked because they didn't know which hospitals are contaminated. So we have to see the big drop in the number of Chinese travelers. So the situation was similar or worse than current coronavirus crisis. The revenues of the hospitals has been dropped, and the usages of mass transportation has also decreased as well. This is a picture that I've taken, and a lot of famous figures were in this picture. The former director general of WHO is here, and Ali Aliya, who is working in Cambodia now, and the communication officer of WHO is here too. And Mario, Maria, who is very active at the WHO, is here in this picture. That means they were coming back to Korea, com coming to Korea to conduct some act, some work. And Professor Lee Jong-gu and ma me myself were also in the picture. Even the nature said that this is all about risk communication because they failed to disclose the information, so it needs to be changed. And in particular, it has caused huge damages to the society and the economy. And also the media and the authorities didn't pay attention to risk communications. That was evaluation of the nature. As Dr. Ji Young Mi mentioned earlier, the IHR said that risk communication is the sixth priority out of eight. But many Korean officials and authority, authorities are not interested in that. And in the risk, risk communication, there are many other activities to establish the manual and to carry out the exercises. And when we have done good exercises, that result should be shared with other countries. We are doing it now. And when Jung Gi Seok led the KCDC, we hosted international conferences to share that experiences and information. And this is the Asia Pacific strategies information. It shows the role of risk communication. Whenever an event happens, the risk is at the center of all activities like multiple sources of information and risk assessment, the risk communication should be at the center. So it is the main access to do the risk communication work. So there, uh, there is some act of the measles outbreak in LA County, USA. It says that every information should be released at every minute because the measles, the RO value of measles is about 14 or higher. Just for information, COVID-19 RO value is 1.5, so the measles is very critical and lethal. And the wider the you know what people's face is even disclosed in the broadcasting, and he even uh, the, the BBC actually back then disclosed all the information where he has been. So all the bars and his even own home were disclosed on the media. So he, Mr. Wolf, who were forced to disclose his identification, were very puzzled. So we are now having the emergency operating center under the KCDC and Office of Communications, which are the new organizations. Out of many things, what is the most important thing is that 
the Korea is the rule abiding country. So according to the Infectious Disease Control and Prevention Act, it clearly describes the how and what information should be revealed in the infectious disease emergency. So where the confirmed case has visited, so the no name of the stores and restaurants and the bars and clubs that have been released and disclosed according to this law. So this shows all the detailed information of the structure. So we have all the manuals, how to and what information should be disclosed. So it is translated in English. So I'm not sure if you are using it, but we have built up KCDC network to exchange information and data. And actually, the wor workers at the public health center, they are getting the information every morning. And about 9,500 are receiving this information on a daily basis. And personally, uh, as I'm working as a vice spokesperson of the Ministry of Health and Welfare, I just wonder how the dis information disclosure is beneficial. So I just prepared a thesis and which was published. And actually, the information disclosure not only meets the right to know, but also very beneficial from the quarantine perspective. I can I employ the segment segre, uh, excuse me segmented regression to prove it statistically. So even though we disclose the information, the list of the contaminated hospital belatedly, but it is very beneficial and effective to control the infectious disease. So again, to control and contain the communicable disease, the information disclosure is playing a key role as a non-medical intervention. Let me just put all the things into the diagram. This is the MERS outbreak. They, uh, this, uh, the information was disclosed very belatedly. So the, not only the authorities, but also the general public had nothing to do with it. However, this time in the crisis of the COVID-19, because we were very, we were taking actions early on. So the civic group and the, even just the general citizens and the many other private center, private sectors are working and taking their own part. So we are reducing the number of confirmed cases, I believe. So four months before today, had Jung Eun Gyeong of KCDC delivered the daily briefing according to the manual, and he she even escalated the state of alert to serious, and all the briefing have been delivered in Korean and English. And actually, it has been delivered based on the structure designed by Professor Jung gi They had daily briefing twice a day. Every morning, every 11 in the morning, the Ministry of Welfare and Health delivered the daily briefing. And in the afternoon, around 2 p.m., KCDC delivered their own daily briefing. Actually, during the MERS outbreak, we just had combination daily briefing, so I don't know which is better and right. And I just, uh, this, what kind of information should be, should be disclosed? Actually, we are using the mobile phone carrier information and immigration services and police information, and all the information are collected to be transmitted to the KCDC, and then that information are largely delivered to and open to the general public. And the, the citizens voluntarily put that information into mobile app. And if you make it enlarged, then they can see which specific you know, restaurants or stores the confirmed cases visited. 
and even the daily newspapers draw the map to show which store and which area is contaminated. To sum it up, to flatten the curve, medical countermeasures but also non-medical countermeasures are very critical and that is changing the situation indeed. The upper one is CDC and the lower graph is my personal opinion. It is still valid. That is the capaci capacity line. It depends on country where their capacity line is located. So anyhow, I'm not sure whether we are at the 10% or 30% of, of the COVID-19. We are still good at containing the COVID-19 after the sporadic cluster contaminations in Itaewon. Five years ago, Korea's quarantine system was largely criticized, but the nature this time again highly appreciated the efforts that Korea has made. They are giving us the very positive uh, feedback on the quarantine pro processes of Korea. But he, from now, this is the thing that I don't disagree. I'm not sure how much information do we have to disclose. According to the recent situation, the information disclosure is getting backward due to the privacy protection, things like that. And the third and second and third edition of this rule has been reduced to protect the privacy. But this, I don't, even though I don't think that is violating Personal Information Protection Act, but many people worry about the privacy violation. This is the messages sent by the Dongjakgu office. It shows the, it, it does not show the specific name of the restaurant or stores. It just to simply say where it is. So here, as you can see, it does not give you the name of the restaurants. So many citizens living in Dongjakgu area of Seoul are very embarrassed to have this kind of information because they don't know which store they have to avoid. So I don't know which is right. This is another message uh, sent by the Yongsanggu office. They don't, they also they don't give me a clear information. Just to, they, they just give us the very vague information because they are saying that the, the blank restaurant located in Itaewon or Yongsan, things like that. So it only caused bigger damages because people avoid going to all restaurants in that area altogether. And some other cases like Kwanaku office gives their citizen to all, all the information including the name of the restaurants. They give all detailed information of which store had been might be contaminated as the confirmed cases visited the store and they even give another information which areas are doing good job at disinfecting that areas. I'm not I'm not here to say which is better and which is wrong, but I'm just sharing the information. This is the the one who is wearing the red one. He w he take they take a picture together and they take a picture together with even nurses. Same thing happened. Actually, this is the same situation what happened in the Britain who's in, who revealed his information about himself and his home. Uh, this is the Chungang Daily Newspaper. This newspaper shared the personal experiences of confirmed cases. 
And because many people wonder what kind of experiences and treatments they have to go through to get healed and cured, so they share that information on the daily, they, on the daily newspapers. Because too many personal informations have been disclosed in this article, so this specific person might be having some panic about his own privacy. But you know, sometimes that can be beneficial to calm down the panic of the general public. This is not the Korea's situation, but the New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, who is fighting against, who is on, who is kind of not in the same line of the Trump President Trump. And one person asked that, "Why do you choose to be so coming forward, straightforward?" And he answered that, "Because." I have to tell you the truth and the situation. I tell you everything I know, and you know everything I know, and you know everything just the way I know it. And that is because this is to encourage all about it. Because I believe everybody should be on the same page. That is the best way to build up solidarity and to have the community uh, engagement. I feel personally my fear and my anxiety. I share that because I want you to believe that you are not alone and so that's why he reveals everything. And some other speaker talk about the statistical remodeling. It shows all the remodeling values. What is wrong from the actual hospitalization and what that how many beds are required and how many beds they are actually having, and how beneficial and effective to have a physical distancing. And they are sharing all the results of the measures they are taking. And uh, they need 140,000 beds, but they just have 53,000 beds. So how can we deal with that? Do we need to build community treatment center? They just ask, he just asked his people what would be the best solution for that. And he also explained why New York has become the hub of the COVID-19. And he gave the explanations. And instead of having worry to be infected, you have to take pride to be New Yorker. And we are focusing on the COVID-19 only, but mapping is more important. It is covered in the New York Times, but the relative risk of infectious disease should be identified. That is very important. All beds and hospitals are, so he, he is not only talking about the result, but share the concerns and the questions he is having with the citizens. And he, there are three factors to lower the values of the, uh, the R0. So how many people can be infected in a, in, in a single confined spaces? So by revealing this kind of factors, he got the ideas from, he got, received and shared the ideas with the general public. Here in Korea, we are having 51 million, and every day, 800 are dying. And the number one cause of death is cancer, uh, which is followed by the cardiovascular disease and TB and Alzheimer's and others. We are not, I'm not talking about whether the value is good or not, but the corona killed about the 260 as of yesterday. And when it comes to the communicable disease, the TB is the biggest leading cause of death, and rather than that, the tubal cocomo is another one. So we have to build up the system, how to communicate with the risk, things like that. But you may misunderstand that it is all about to causing confusion among the general public, but I'm not talking about that. I'm just uh, talking about the facts. This is the thing that we have to consider. 
If we need to disclose the information swiftly, accurately, and transparently, then we also consider the differences between actual risk to uh, from the perceived risk. So the perceived risk is not the actual risk, but the risk that is a build up based on the information that they are getting. So to reduce the gap between the two is very important to the society as a whole. And the Korean government is doing pretty good, but also the New York governor is doing pretty good job too. So by providing that kind of information and the kind of concerns with the citizens, we can uh, make an informed decision together with the general public, not only for the communicable disease, but also chronic disease. We shouldn't be uh, overwhelmed by the COVID-19 because we still have another patients who are suffering from other diseases as well. Some countries are suffer more from the food security, so we need to take another approach depending on the characteristics of the issue. And also the vulnerable demographic group and the sexual minority is another thing we have to think about what access would be better. One people said that the COVID-19 is targeting to the vulnerable chain. But once the 5% of the vulnerable chain is breaking down, the 95% of the remaining population will be affected. So from the perspective, we have to consider if we just focus on the human beings or ecosystem altogether. So COVID-19 is not only the important issue for the Ministry of Health and Ministry Health and Welfare, but also Ministry of the, the, the Agriculture and Ministry of Infrastructure and many others. And I think ultimately we have to build up and think about what risk communication is better from the whole universal perspective. So to sum it up, therapeutics and vaccines are important, but we have to go beyond that. So the risk of communication is critical because the general public, when they are facing the crisis, are becoming panicked and they just take care of their own interest. That is very natural. So how we can persuade the public and based on the behavior sciences, we have to have a better approaches and that is the best way to save not only human beings, but also the whole earth. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Now we have a final presentation left. Professor Yu Myung Soon at the Healthcare Grad School of the Seoul National University will present next. Um, regarding the current COVID-19 crisis, she carried out uh, multiple uh, awareness studies against Korean citizens, and she probably knows the most about how social sentiment and response have been changing over the course of the crisis. Please give her a big hand. Hello everyone, my name is Myungsun Yu. I'm also a member of the SNU National Strategy Committee and uh, it's an honor for me to be here. I hope that my presentation can contri contri contribute to the development and resolution of the current crisis. Today I would like to uh, look back on the past four months under the title of um, disaster sentiment and social risk recognition. After the first patient appeared, it has been four months and no one was free from the COVID-19 crisis, no single day, including myself. If you look at the yellow marked sentences and phrase phrases, I could not add another um, piece of information over here 
um, from yesterday, we have been focusing more on how these people have um, been infected. But I think there are more uh, meaningful ways to look at this crisis when it comes to the sacrifice of medical professionals. After we turned to um, living, living and lifestyle uh, quarantine measures, the Itaewon outbreak and other relevant cases um, have been shown. And even though Korea is faring better than other foreign countries, and that is why we're easing the lockdown and social distancing measures, I do not think our situation is too different from other countries. For a great uh, while, we will have to suffer from the crisis. So what we need to do at this point is to think about how to form our new normal. Um, there was a study on uh, four different classes that are affected by the COVID-19. Uh, Professor Wrights have um, published this measure and garnering a lot of attention. So even though the virus itself is impartial, the social class and social uh, positions uh, are affecting different people in a different way. So that is why uh, we have to think that even though this crisis is an can be an opportunity for some people, this could actually affect some groups of people in a very uh, horrible and terrifying way. So in that sense, we have to look at this infection, this outbreak, is acceptable to our society or not? And who are affected more than uh, other people? So when I'm looking at this, I would like to use the lens of uh, disaster, psychology, social risk recognition. And I also want to look at our beliefs, where um, uh, beliefs that can deter our response measures. So by doing this research, one of the, uh, qu while doing this research, I um, frequently get questions from uh, people that surround me. People say, how did you uh, effectively manage and um, deter the massive outbreak in the Korean society? And people say on media that Asians or Koreans have this unique uh, DNA or genes that are um, advantageous for overcoming viruses or crises. But I think there's a meaning to looking back on materials about social uh, responsibility and vulnerability. Because uh, individual societal uh, characteristics and features could contribute to the resilience for a crisis when it comes to making and creating uh, measures. And when it comes to understanding social recognition, these materials will be very helpful. When I was doing similar studies for a MERS, it was a post-crisis um, study, and people would like to hear something positive. That is why responses or answers from people were maybe not 100% um, objective. I have con carried out five different surveys on um, Seoul citizens with about f 8 million uh, people. And let me share the research results. First of all, if you th um, think about how big of a threat this is, from a uh, lay citizen's perspective. And when they're looking at the severity of the crisis, and I we threw these questions to um, different people. And if you look, about, think ab look at the red part over here, they said, what is going to affect the most? Like my, um, the possibility of me infecting other people was the biggest concern they had. We talked about um, R index and other uh, indicators. This is much lower than MERS, or also much lower than um, regular influenza and flu. And we might think that people are looking at it differently because they are more concerned about the fact that they might infect other people. 
It's not just the science, it's also psychological element and factor. So this outbreak of uh, COVID-19, it's not uh, acceptable or non-acceptable, it's somewhere between the two. So what we need to do when we are uh, opening up our um, businesses and daily lives, we have to maintain social distancing and we have to protect human rights and we have to uh, g make sure that this virus is within a category of acceptable crisis. So now what we need to look at is how this recognition is or per perception is uh, formed and be made. When there was a Shincheonji church shock in Daegu and Gyeongbuk region and also the Itaewon crisis in Seoul, the people uh, people view these two cases from a uh, with a different lens and they also looked at how the virus had spread because of what behavior or actions of the infected patients and if you look at this um, people's general and uh, underlying health conditions were influential to their perception of this virus there was another study that I carried out with my colleague, and the current physical condition was the most important factor when it comes to them evaluating the impact of the virus. When they were talking about um, seriousness of, of the virus, what would matter the most when you were in infected? I thought it would be health or uh, economic, but people have said that they were worried the most about them infected other people, meaning they do not want to inconvenience other people. They do not want to damage other people's lives. This is different from uh, what's happening in foreign countries. Just like um, Professor Kim has mentioned earlier, civil awareness and civil attitude and mindset are playing a role here. Why do people have this fear during the COVID-19 crisis? When you are ill, when you have an illness, you think about yourself. You do not think about what other people think of you. Of course, there are some diseases that are relevant to social uh, stigma or prejudice, but I thought COVID-19 would not be a type of disease that will incur uh, those uh, stigma or prejudice. Because if you look at these responses, they said, oh, I'm afraid that people who are infected but have no symptoms are around me. Or people, uh, uh, they are afraid that other people who have this virus do not have um, proper testing or proper uh, sanitation measures. And they were also afraid that, oh, why did you go to the specific place where um, uh, the when, when this specific location uh, turned out to be dangerous and if they caught uh, they they catch the disease and they were afraid that um, family members or friends uh, would would criticize them about their own behavior and this was largely related to the previous Shincheonji church cases at that time when people who do not go to the Shincheonji church, just because they lived in the vicinity of the uh, location, there were a great deal of criticism poured onto the residents of Daegu and Gyeongbok. And if you look at the recent case in Itaewon on May 4th, when people, uh, the people who went to the clubs in Itaewon were uh, in their 20s and 30s, and many comments on the internet blame their behavior of going to clubs in this um, um, crisis. And if you think about 20s and 30s, they are having uh, difficulties. They are losing their part-time jobs. They're not um, taking exams because of this abnormal situation and measures. And when they are calculating their own danger, they do not think about the uh, infection itself. They think about damages that are going to follow from the infection. So 
when they are going to be confirmed, if you think if you compare the cost of these two, the actual damage of infection is smaller than other um, following criticism or impact that the patients are going to go through. Just like previously, Mr. Park mentioned, MERS was reported um, quite later than the actual cases. But if you think about the media reports around the COVID-19 crisis, the media reports were published very timely and in a, an, in a very early stage. Not so much on uh, when the Shincheonji Church case broke out. Still, many and a number of media reports are being poured out on, on the internet and also on paper, garnering attention from general citizens. When people are accessing these artic articles, we asked, what do you feel when you hear the news about COVID-19? The first and the primary response was, um, fear, but unlike the first or second um, massive breakouts, people have uh, experienced anger. In February and in May, when there were group cases, people felt anger because there are a number of people who sacrifice themselves to comply with social distancing and um, we have been faring well and responding well and managing well, and there are a uh, few people who cannot sacrifice their freedom for the benefit of the public, then this fact itself is um, making the general public be um, furious and be angry. But if you think about the fear itself, the size of fear is actually decreasing. And one impact that you can see from news articles is that uh, is about the hate speech and hate expressions. The most common hate speech was about China and Chinese citizens. And this um, subject has been changing. During the fifth crisis, it was about social minorities and also uh, sexual minorities and also the ones who are breaking the social norm and social rules. It's very meaningful, both academically and also realistically. Uh, we tend to blame individuals for infection. You can see that the during the fifth crisi crisis, this uh, blaming on individuals have uh, increased uh, during the fifth crisis compared to other previous cases. The uh, clubbers in Itaewon are criticized more heavily than uh, previous cases because people are now thinking that, oh, it's individual's responsibility to not catch the disease. So we are now putting more focus and responsibility on individuals. We have been carrying out mm, a number of studies and um, people have said that it's just mere luck and our, fa our fate is determined. When more and more people think like this, then they do not accept government measures. And when you look at uh, metropolitan residents, they tend to believe in this uh, fate theory and uh, people in their 20s and 30s tend to think that it's just their luck to be infected or not be infected. And next, I'm going to, maybe I'm going to ask Professor Kim to give more thorough interpretation later during the discussion. But whenever there is a praise of K-quarantine or K-response measures, they talk about uh, the excellence of test kits and also the KCDC's response. But what we need to look at is the civil society's um, willingness and voluntary support. And we asked relevant questions to citizens, and they said that internal awareness was excellent, and external uh, awareness was also uh, not too bad. So our citizens thought and th are still thinking that how they respond and how they comply with government measures are going to impact the general societal uh, journey and pathway. 
Now, uh, moving on to individual practices, people have been wearing masks, and um, it's becoming m more and more. Uh, it's becoming better, better, better. Um, you cannot even use public transit during rush hours if you do not have a mask. However, if you think about social distancing, it's has uh, becoming um, lenient and loose. Uh, what I witness during the fifth crisis is this. From an individual um, cri um, perspective, they said they have been doing wearing masks. They have been wearing masks very thoroughly every day. But when it comes to social measures and complying with government measures, they m answer that they do not uh, comply with those measures as well. So social distancing itself has been working well, but it's just an individual um, level. Um, living quarantines objectives are not going to be achieved properly if um, their compliance with the government is not working well. So the first and second and third crises have some people who could not, who did not go to hospitals, even though even though they had symptoms, and they also uh, we also looked at whether there were people who could not go to hospitals when they wanted to for diagnosis. So 18 percent of total respondents did not go to hospitals, and they said the reason why they did not go to hospitals was because hospitals are the most dangerous places during the time. So whether when it comes to information sharing or whether using other approaches, we need to overcome this uh, awareness at the society. Because if they do not get proper measures, medical measures, uh, at an important time, their um, illnesses and uh, conditions may worsen. Because I'm running out of time, I'm going to look at how our lives have become different after the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, according to our first research, the um, point was 58.4. So zero means everything has stopped. 100% means it's totally normal. So when the uh, Sinchonji church uh, happened, um, the point went down to 48. So of course, people can interpret these figures in a different way. But you can see that compared to the first uh, measurement, our, our sentiment is lower uh, right now, meaning people are feeling that their lives are damaged still. And um, the people who are making the same amount of uh, money are only 50% of the total respondents. And many of them either lost jobs or were not making any money. And many healthcare specialists and disaster perception specialists uh, say in one voice that the citizens are going through a massive amount of stress. But because we measure this stress level a year later, uh, this could not be so accurate. So we used a tool that we can use uh, to measure the sentiment right after the uh, crisis, and only 10% uh, said they do not need help, and 15% said they need help right away, and about 50% uh, of people said they uh, need constant monitoring from the government. This is a very important graph that is garnering attention from abroad. After a 100-day mark has passed, about the task force is launched. You can see that the public trust on these government agencies have been uh, maintaining a great level of trust from the citizens. That is why some professors today mentioned that uh, government's communication measures have been very effective and efficient. If you look at uh, three major factors of civil society, first, trust, second is cooperation, third is memory and lessons from MERS. I believe the number one differentiating factor between foreign countries and Korea would be our experience with MERS. 
And the fact that we have national uh, health care reserve where people do not have to fear about medical costs is very important. People uh, say that medical uh, officials and phys physicians sacrificed everything about their life to help the general public health improvement. Instead of uh, treatment and cure, we need to focus on quarantine and uh, prevention. COVID-19 crisis is not going to be an opportunity for everyone. If you are a woman, if you are um, young, and if you are vulnerable and marginalized, this is more of a crisis than an opportunity. People who think th uh, consider themselves conservative thought uh, this crisis as a crisis. I looked at four different challenges, and uh, from our success case of the K quarantine measures, I want to look at how we're going to become a society that recovers uh, disasters. If you think about individual excellence, how this individual excellence can spread to social and group practices is my focus. You have to balance between uh, public health versus per, uh, personal privacy. And for the ones who are damaged when it comes to leading their daily lives, how we're going to protect this group of people is our challenge and our task. We have to re design all spaces in our society and the standards of uh, making a great citizen will have to change. This can't be done with just a small group of people. Everyone has to participate in this effort. I think I'm almost uh, there. I'll show you this image and then I'll be done in 10 seconds. Uh, we are not just hit by a fist that um, came out of nowhere. The COVID-19 has been affecting our lives. We are lost and we feel like we are in great danger. If you think about the livelihood of uh, moms who stay at mom uh, stay at the houses, how are we going to protect them? How are we going to protect these women? And if you think about residents of Daegu and Gyeongbok, how are you going to s give support to the residents of Daegu and Gyeongbok? What about the poor and socially marginalized who are suffering um, economically? These are the challenges and tasks we have to resolve. Thank you. Yeah, good Thank you. And now let's move on to the discussion. And during the second session, just like session one, we are having two separate discussions. So two of discussants will deliver very brief presentation. First up, Professor Park sang of Seoul National University Hospital will share his uh, experiences to treat COVID-19 patients. So he's uh, carrying out two roles as a treating the uh, two roles, and so he will share his experiences with you. Hello, everyone. I am Park sang -won, just as introduced. I just to check my pictures. You know, the pictures I had more hairs than I am now. And during the Corona COVID-19 crisis and the MERS crisis, actually these two are biggest contributor for me to lo lose my hair. So the previous speaker talked about the PTSD. I mean, actually, I suffer from the PTSD. During the MERS crisis, I experienced the PTSD, which lasted about a year. I'm not sure how long I suffer from the PTSD this time, but I'd like to share my experiences with you. Because I'm a discussant, let me just sum up my experiences so I just make some presentation materials. Personally, 
I have been in clinical industry for about 20 years. I am expert to three infectious diseases, uh, swine flu for the first, and MERS in 2015, and COVID-19 this time. I'm sick and tired of having another infectious disease because I am tired because we have made developments clearly but there are not many differences when we are you know de dealing with and de responding to the crisis so let me sum up what I learned from this crisis because I am working as the head of a communicable disease department so when we are coming up with the countermeasures I am the responsible manager to set that up so I understand what happened in the front line and as a real practitioner I am taking care of the infected cases so I can deliver more vivid cases for you. While experiencing and getting through the COVID-19, I see the developments we have made. The first thing is that the quick introduction and expansion of the lab test is a very positive and beneficial development that is clearly different from the previous. And we also did some tests and diagnosis at the clinical level, but there was a lot of limitations in the past because the KCDC have developed a lot and it is very scientific and the rigid structure. So once they set the standard, if any minor things is getting away from that standard, then they don't allow us to do some any other things. But in the in the coronavirus crisis, they just give us a lot of flexibility. So we are able to do some the tests at the hospital level. At the clinical condition, there are atypical patients, so we are having some flexibility to identify such kind of atypical patients. And the, as you have mentioned, transparency and the swiftness of the sharing the information have improved. Uh, during the MERS crisis, there was no transparent disclosure of information, so the doctors privately shared and exchanged information. And we also uh, scale up the response capa capacity in, in hospital. And during the MERS crisis, there was infection control nurse. I just had 1.5 infection control and management nurses, but now the number has increased to six. So when I need to develop the policies and countermeasures, I can get a lot of help because I can cooperate with six uh, infection management nurses. The another good result of this COVID-19 is community treatment center. It doesn't look that great and big, but it is innovative measures we take, and the role of a public health center has improved and settled down. And the role of the public health center should be developed in that way in the future too. So the government tried to have a communications with the expert groups this time. So we just put some numbers of the patients we have treated in our house, including the patients treated at the CTC. We have about 200 patients. I'm not sure how the general public uh, understand that, but uh, we have 200 confirmed cases so far. Uh, some of the patients are using the ECMA and some other equipment. Once we are having the one, uh, the serious cases, then a lot of doctors and the medical staff should uh, focus on. If we are having 200 serious cases, then one single hospital cannot handle that. But luckily, according to the clinical characteristics of the COVID-19, 80% of the confirmed cases show very light symptoms based on the Chinese cases. But in case of Korea, of almost 95% of confirmed cases show only 
very light and mild symptoms, so we can handle this big number of uh, patients. But there is a certain areas who, certain areas whose confirmed cases show serious the symptoms, just like a Daegu Gyeongbok. So as they fail to deal with all that serious cases that has translated into higher fertility, uh, the motility, motility rate. So, but as you can see in the map, there are many reserves in doctors and nurses in other areas, but that's not the test. So the things we can improve is that we need to secure proper number of experts. We need to nurture uh, the experts. And sometimes if a certain area requires a bigger number of the doctors and medical staffs for the emergency, then we can uh, dispatch the uh, medical staff. But that's not real. Th that's not realistic because doctors working, doctors and nurses are working as a team. So teamwork is critical to deliver the results. So it is not realistic. And if you go to the hospital, you can see a lot of patients with uh, all different ills. So we have to change the system and structure of the hospitals to protect patients from getting other disease. And also, we have to build up the decision-making process that largely involves with the experts. And the, even though there is experts, uh, there are a lot of people who want to be vocal to when making the decision. So we need to make the decision-making process better. And also the cost is one big important part, but many try to avoid to talk, to talk about the cost because it is sensitive. But when we are discussing who gonna pay the cost, that there are a lot disagreements. So it's the area where we see, this is the area where we are difficult to imp make an improvement. And the another area we need to improve is that it seems like the current hospitals are doing pretty well. But how do you think how many medical doctors should be engaged to deal with and treat a thing, a confirmed case? Very small and limited number of the steps of focusing on to treat uh, the uh, confirmed case. So we need to build up specialized infectious disease hospital. Instead of focusing and investing in the physical facility and physical equipment, we have to uh, scale up the software. And we also have to speed up to produce and distribute the clinical data. To make that clinical data, we have to strengthen the infrastructure of the hospital first. So once, if we are having a special infectious disease specialized hospitals, then it is the best to build up the capacity, response capacity to communicable disease. Last but not least, everything will be disappeared once we are getting over the COVID-19. So some people ask a question if we need to make a huge investment in these areas. But let alone the COVID-19, we have to treat a lot of the communicable disease, such as the hospital transmission and the traditional infectious disease. It is not known to the general public, but so we still need to build infectious disease specialized hospital. That's it. Thank you. Yes, let me invite another uh, discussant, uh, Professor Kim Uyung from Seoul National University Political Science and Diplomacy Department. He has been interested in the social, uh, civil society's response to the crisis. Please give him a backhand. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Young Kim, as introduced. I think I'm maybe the only uh, political science major among all the participants and discussants today. Uh, aside from medical specialists, I am the only uh, political scientist, and I came here to learn a lot from you, and I have been learning a lot. And I suggest that we can maybe take this opportunity to share our individual opinions. And Professor Chong also gave me some homework to do uh, when it comes to preparing today's discussion. Um, because everyone came here with um, documents and PPT slides, I made some for myself too. I have three different slides. If I have to summarize and converge all the presentations today, I would like to um, put focus on diversity. Many different entities have been contributing in, a, in their unique way so far. First of all, Professor Hong mm, talked about private and public partnership. And he gave many different examples. He talked about KCDC. He talked about corporations. And he talked about uh, citizens. Uh, when uh, he was uh, mentioning the KCDC, and for the ones, the ones who used to head and lead the organization, they also emphasized on the importance of private sector. Uh, he also shared how difficult it was to communicate with government officials. So that was rather a uh, private citizen's perspective after working with the government. And um, Representative Kim talked about the role of case CSO. She specifically talked about inequality and opportunity discrepancy, and the civil society can play a big role in bridging the gap. And Professor Park, I was so sold on your presentation. I did not know risk communication was so important. Uh, he showed many different information and different materials, and the presentation was very convincing. And if you look at uh, the presentation more specific specifically, not just the government briefing, but also media plays a big role, and citizens' communication also has to do with a lot about this effective communication. They can create the pathways of infected citizens, and by utilizing their information and data, by sending this data to the government, the government can actually take advantage of the data and we send the data for the public. And and I feel like the last presentation, I was bombarded with just so much data. All kinds of data was organized by her. And our focus here is the response of the Korean civic society. And in order to look at their response, we have to look at their awareness, how they are recognizing and viewing the current situation. And he also, she also asked a question to me during her presentation as well. And today, at this discussion, I would say that diverse groups of people, diverse entities, are contributing to this crisis in their unique way. Now let's look at this uh, graph. I don't know if you can see it well, but the y-axis shows the fertility rate of the COVID-19, and the x-axis shows the participation level of citizens. So now we can see the correlation between democracy and the death rate. As you can see, because of course this is just a theory and an assumption, and since Professor Yu talked about how people are feeling having high self-efficacy, when citizens want to participate, they have to feel self-efficacy where the government is actually listening to their voices. And with this trust, 
if they are uh, feeling that the government is listening to their voices, then it's more likely for them to follow and comply with uh, government suggested measures. And uh, this uh, civil groups have been effectively delivering government measures to different walks of society. When the network was tightly uh, knitted and interconnected, because of uh, this interconnectedness, you can strengthen um, resilience as well. There are many different theories and assumptions. Let's look at Korea. Koreans have self-efficacy. This is proven through our last general election as well. If you think about the pri previous uh, cell ferry accident, when we asked a question about self-efficacy, right after that, the response was somewhat was different. After going through different models of public and private um, partnership, the people now think about and discover the new role of the government. What does the government mean to their life? And by going through this process, their self-efficacy goes up. And they can trust the government better. And they listen to government suggestions better. Then where does this uh, civil awareness uh, come from? This total cycle and process uh, going between the government and general citizens is creating the virtual cycle. Professor Hong mentioned that um, if you listen to a UK ambassador to Korea, because of the civil awareness, great civil awareness of Korea, even if there is an individual sacrifice, uh, Korean people tend to contribute to uh, society, societal benefit. So he, the ambassador mentioned the spirit of sacrifice. And our um, foreign minister, Kang kyung hwa said COVID-19 requires a great a deal of uh, sacrifice. When you think about civil awareness, it revolves around sacrifice, but it also has to do with political demand. So you have to be able to cooperate, but at the same time, you have to be able to fight well when things are going raw, wrong. This is how Korea has been um, bettering and improving civil awareness. Through all these mechanisms, and we can see then when a country or a place has accumulated excellent and positive civil awareness, it's more likely for that society to respond to the crisis in a more effective way. We also were able to see uh, Daegu, Gyeongbok, local government's responses. If you look at Jeonju, the city of Jeonju, they started the emergency uh, income and they also uh, carried out uh, many different societal and volunteering activities and campaigns. So not just the central government, but local governments have been showing and proving their capabilities when it comes to fighting against the virus. I think Seoul National University is uh, doing the same today. We can specifically find ways to contribute to the crisis. You talked about um, creating a platform. That could be one way uh, where universities can contribute as well. How we're going to contribute to local communities. And what about social and humanities specialists and experts? What roles that are they going to play? They can also um, be very helpful when it comes to building resilience against the virus. Thank you. So let's jump into the discussion. All the speakers and discussants, would you please come to the stage and have a seat? I do, uh, please take a seat in the order of a presentation from here. Because we are behind the schedule, I'd like to ask a very brief questions first to each presenter, and then we are going back to the questions we have received from online. 
First, let's begin with the Professor Hong Jun Hyung. So you can see the political system and um, response to COVID-19. Oh, I didn't see that there was much correlation between those two, but you uh, predicted an emer the emergence of a healthcare state. Do you think healthcare states are going to appear globally? Uh, the reason why I mentioned that was because um, big governments are um, mentioned. Many experts have the same opinion. But if you look at the content of big governments or big states, they're going to emphasize on disease control measures. The disease control department is going to take up a great share of government administration. And when you think about a healthcare state, this is something that we cannot avoid. There has been many different changes and transformation when it comes to the characteristics of governments. There are freedom, a free state and um, civil state, democratic states, and there have been many different um, functionalities. But when you think about a healthcare state, it focuses more on uh, citizens' security and uh, public health. I did not get to touch upon this area, but within our government organization, there uh, is NSC, National Security Council. And uh, I believe that there is going to be an organization newly appearing and emerging that is going to be constantly in, in place it could be the Ministry of Health or something that's similar to that. The KCDC is uh, becoming an administration. And just because of that, they're not going to talk to ministers. Because if you think about the characteristics and nature of um, other ministries, that's just not compatible because the Ministry of Finance or Strategy, they might provide support to the KCDC, but once our crisis is mm, getting better, then I don't think um, this approach is consistent. So when you say, when I say a healthcare state emerging in the future, it could be a very important target. Of course, there are some risks accompanying as well, because it could be a, a surveillance country a country acting like a big brother. Now let me ask a question to um, Dr. Kim. So when it comes to the vulnerable or uh, the minorities, these groups face a lack of information and lack of knowledge. And for these groups, the government or civil society are using what measures to help them understand better about the situation? Or what kind of measures do we have to adopt to help them? Well, I don't think there is one single answer. But because we witnessed some uh, successful cases in the past, we can learn from them. Whenever crisis strikes us, we cannot approach them to individuals, meaning the disabled or minorities. So what we need to do then is that we have to think about human rights of these marginalized. And we, because we have existing organizations and civic groups that have been helping these people, local governments and central governments have to um, build a manual while listening to their voices, and they have to share the, their draft with these marginalized groups. This is not a hard thing. They can for sure do this. Because we have already seen successful cases, now we need to evaluate what has been done, and during the second wave or other a public health crisis strike our society, we can mm, take advantage of this. And today, at uh, this time, uh, we have understand the importance of the risk 
management and with the communications. Whenever we have the briefings, it is led by the head of KCDC and the Ministry of Health and Welfare. They are actually making the decisions. And what level is the relevant to make the decisions? Have you ever think about it? Well, the minister that I just served to for are total, uh, are six in total. And I have been serving them for them to take part in the hearings. And there was the minister named Im Che Min. He said that before. Uh, just to, what about one person can be representing the Ministry of Health and Welfare with, uh, uh, instead of changing faces all the time? So one single state, uh, spokesperson and one single the representatives of the ministry is better to build trust and consensus from the public. So actually, we tried that before. But actually, the organization should change. So it was not realistic. But there is no single right answer. As I mentioned in my presentation, the governor, New York governor, Andrew Cuomo, understand the situation really well and he set up and established policies from the perspective so that is very beneficial so the the general acceptance rating for the these two people are pretty good one largely people are saying that their voice is pretty stable and good so give some a sense of security so you know they are spending at on hour every day so it is kind of a time and energy consuming they have to use that time to make a better decisions but actually in other perspective that is a very valuable time to build trust with the public and to share the information with the public so by making most of the time they can build up trust by exchanging information. That is one good beneficial by having the daily briefing. But I think the Ministry of Health also have this kind of concerns. The policymakers are actually behind, are in the behind, are behind the scenes. Some are the doctors in public health, and some are, are experts in other industry. If they do not build up experiences, they cannot give the right answers. But there is not a single answer to that. So these two heads will leave later. So the capable candidate should be trained all the time to represent such agencies all the time. And I think uh, they need to have some trainings as well. You know, if they, if you are standing before the cameras, they are panicked. They are kind of uh, paralyzed. If they are paralyzed before the camera, their insecurity delivered to the general public. So that's another important point. Um, now, um, Professor Yu, many have um, not listen to government measures. If you think about the 20s and 30s who were in Taiwan during the crisis, uh, during the blow up, and do you think people are getting tired of the current measures? Well, that is a great question, and I'm also curious about that as well, and I have a plan to look into it in more detail. But as I shared earlier during my presentation, when there is a disease and if something happens that is not planned, then I feel like people think, oh, what's the use of preparing or doing uh, things to prevent it? Because no matter what they do, people who are going to get it will get it, and people who are not going to get it will get it. But um, during the initial process, people are likely to listen to uh, social measures, but when things are protracted and prolonged, 
then people tend to just ignore the suggestions. And younger uh, groups tend to think that it's um, they um, tend to be fatalistic, meaning that their fate is already determined. Even though there is some correlation between what they do and the likelihood of getting a disease. When you s initiate a gathering, then when someone suggests to meet up, the other friend has to agree to that. And let's say one person is infected, then if you think about how um, the likelihood of family members getting it has been changing so far, when you say an uh, individual, it's just we only been calculating the number of people. There was no relationship analysis between families or um, friends. And I think we need to uh, make sure that there is social communication, how you may impact your family members and you may impact people that are close to you instead of mere um, number decrease or increase. And of course, the time, the prolonged uh, measures have played for sure, a role for sure. And I think 2030s, more than this fatalistic approach, I think their confidence on their health conditions played a bigger role. I also showed this through a graph. Uh, when you mm, measure and evaluate the severity of the infection, uh, senior citizens know that it could be very um, damaging to their health. But 20s and 30s, it's a great asset that they are healthy. And um, that is why they're confident about what they want to do. But just like what um, Professor Hong shared, when crisis strikes the society, we need to think about uh, our ethics, our moral uh, preparedness. So it's hard to say a conclusion, but yeah, this is what I would like to share. Another brief question to Professor Park Sang Won. When you treat the COVID confirmed cases, the, the patients were under huge stresses for the isolations. And are they very cooperative to deal with the stresses for the isolation? Well, all the hospitalized uh, cases are just staying very short period of time. So I believe the having the CTC is a very beneficial because they are trans transmitted to the CTC. What we have experienced from the MERS crisis, the, cri uh, the standard to release from quarantine is very strict because it's based on RT-PCT. So we have to check until the very last moment, all the viruses are getting out from their bodies. So they have to stay three to four weeks under the control. So we take the preemptive measures because we have experienced the MERS. They are okay until two weeks because you know they have mixed feelings at the very beginning. They feel some fear and because the privacy has been revealed, so they got a lot of phone calling to comport to give them the comfort. So actually, it is better to isolate them for the first to two weeks. And after the two weeks, they are put themselves together, so they want to get back to their home. If we just to persuade them, if we fail to persuade them, they uh, put the fingers towards the doctors and nurses and medical staffs. So I just to give all the explanations to the patients in advance. So instead of uh, the ex explode their angers to the wrong person, uh, please explain the the emotions to me very well. Then we can overcome together. So you know there is a clear difference is if I explain it in advance or not. There's some other doctors who didn't give this kind of explanations in advance were attacked emotionally by the patient. So it's a little better 
to deal with the patients until the last moment if we explain about their emotion changes until the last moment. So that is very helpful. So please show the questions on the screen while we are preparing for the questions from the audiences. So you talk about the volunteering and the very advanced and sophisticated sense of citizenship. Do you think it will be expanded and advanced better in the future? Yeah, so let me um, say three things. So first, how and why the civil society have been responding very well. And one key word was policy studying. So they have learned through looking at policies. And number two is incentivization. By making measures, policy measures, more sophisticated, um, civil society can respond better with the perspective of learning, including the cell for uh, accident. Maybe I'm talking about a broad concept, but because I'm a political scientist, I think we need to think about our DNA as a people. If you think about the Japanese uh, colonization, we uh, work together. And also during the ancient financial crisis, we also work together. So this we have a DNA to be able to cooperate one another during difficult times. Think about Tonghak um, movement and all the democratic movements uh, in the modern history. And also the candlelight movement and revolution carried out by Korean citizens and also um, campaigns against Japanese um, attempt to promote certain symbols. If you think about um, learning, studying, and measures, I think we can enable um, the enable the civil society to become better and better. When this goes in a wrong direction, it could maybe become a cartel, which is a negative uh, approach. But by how we're going to make incentivization more uh, sophisticated, and we also have to think about the risk communication of the head of state. Of course, informing others and citizens is important. But leadership, the leader's risk communication to gather the social uh, willingness to work together is very important. When we are building governance, uh, we need to look at all these different axes and um, pillars. I believe that in, uh, in the future, Korea's um, response measures will be positively viewed. Let's uh, ask a couple of questions to the interest of the time. Let's begin with the third questions. I ignore the psychological quarantine. Thank you for pointing that out. Would you please suggest some ideas to have a better psychological quarantine? Well, simply speaking, because I cannot give my personal opinions only, so at the national level, we have a, a trauma support center and they share a lot of information. As Professor Ki mentioned earlier, education is very important. And the first thing is that please don't forget you are not alone. So as the survey showed that people feel they are helpless, there is nothing they can do about it. But actually, uh, they are having two different uh, emotions at the same time. One is they cannot do anything, the other they can do something. So just to have understanding that you are not alone and then just to try to search the relevant information for you. And that's the first recommendation and the not experts say for that. First is that do not uh, search for the information excessively. You know, people spend two hours to search for the COVID-19. You know, the older the population is, the more they search for. So uh, stop yourself from searching more and better. And the second thing is, yeah, that's the first and the most important recommendations. Would you please go to the next, next questions? Yeah, please uh, move to the next slide. So let's look at the third question. 
I think the information disclosure surrounding the Itaewon crisis might cause um, social hatred. What do you think? Media is triggering this trend. Well, media can be viewed positively and also uh, negatively. And I think um, social, I think media needs to understand and face that what they are, how they are influencing the general public. There are media reporting guidelines and principles, but they did not follow the guidelines and principles. That is why, by uh, experiencing this case, the media has to uh, be stricter on what they report, and civil society and all the media-related committees have to uh, monitor them more strictly for uh, the improvement in the future. One more pages of questions. Well, information disclosure is important, but depending on the cases, it might violate the privacy and personal information. So regarding this issue, who going to be the right person to give us the answer? Professor Hong, would you please? Very recently, Minister Kang kyung had an interview with international media and she talked about the Itaewon cluster transmission. And the media asked very critical questions to Korea. And they suggested the idea, the discrimination against the sexual minority. And she gave a very smart answer. There, she said that there was no social consensus on the so sexual the minority. And it is unacceptable to discriminate against the sexual minority. I think these are very uh, the smart answers and attitudes. That, depending on the the right to know of the public, so we have to defend ourselves on the on one hand. On the on the other hand, the confirmed cases and the, some contact and the privacy of them and all the people who are related to their movement to pass. We have to secure the freedom and right to uh, promote their interest. So we have to make a, be make a balance between the two. Then who going to decide the balance? We, the standards are set by the laws and regulations. That is clearly stated in the, uh, the Infectious Disease Prevention and Control Act. Of course, it has been revised a couple of times, but it has very specifically defined and controlled everything. But if people are complying with that regulation, well, it's a different story. Thank you. Uh, I see a number of questions being posted online, but because of our time constraints, we should not be able to carry the discussion on. But um, I believe that these questions, and the in the first forum, if you look at these questions, the first poll forum focused on um, more um, scientific um, areas and fields, but the second forum that we're planning is going to I'll discuss more about social economic factors. So I believe all these questions that we are seeing uh, will be able to be answered then on the second forum, uh, which is going to be June 24th. I would like to ask you to participate in our second forum as well. And I would like to give gratitude and special thanks to participants and also the online visitors who have joined today as well. This concludes today's forum. Thank you very much.